Great. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to this April 2024 meeting of the Transportation Committee of Community Board 4. Uh, hello to everyone who's here in person. Hello to everyone who is online with us. Uh, we're happy you're here. Um, I do have some standard uh, text that I must read before we get going that everyone on the committee is familiar with, uh, but uh, I, I must read it nonetheless. Uh, just as a reminder, MCB4 has adopted a hybrid meeting policy whereby we will meet in person uh, with a remote option. All community board meetings will require an in-person quorum to come to order and conduct business. Committee members are expected to attend meetings in person unless they have a disability or an extraordinary circumstance as defined by the New York State Open Meetings Law. Excused committee members attending remotely can fully participate in the meeting and must leave their cameras on. Due to public health best practices and space limitations, we encourage members of the public to join virtually, as I see many have. Uh, members of the public that are attending remotely can fully participate in the meeting. The MCB4 hybrid policy can be found on our website. And as always, tonight's meeting is being recorded and is currently live streaming on YouTube. Thank you all very much. Um, so as also, as we uh, usually start these things off. Um, I think you know it's important we take a moment just to introduce ourselves to any members of the public uh, who are here for the first time. Uh, my name is Jesse Greenwald. Uh, I am a Chelsea resident and I am the co-chair of the Transportation Committee. Kristen Murte, co-chair. Hi, Charlie Todd, member of the committee. Glenn Brownman, member of the committee. David Warren, member of the committee. Rodney Washington, member of Chelsea. Adam Austin, member from Chelsea. Andrew Miller, member of the committee. Pete Diaz, member of the committee. Brad Miller, member of the committee. Brad Perfect, public member, member of the committee. Nicely kind. All right. Um, so we have a very full agenda this evening. Uh, we have a lot to discuss, a lot of presentations. Um, I'm looking forward to some full and discussion. Uh, so um, to begin, we have an application uh, for the uh, by the poster house for a block party on 24th Street this summer. Um, and I know uh, uh, we should have a, at least one uh, representative from Poster House with us here this evening to make a presentation. Uh, so um, if Salvador and anyone else are, are here, uh, oh, oh, I see that right here. Uh, uh, hi there, uh, you, can, you can get going. Awesome, <clears throat> thanks so much for having me. Um, I prepared a brief presentation, so I'm just gonna start sharing my screen. Um, one second and here we go. Okay. And can everyone see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And just the presentation, not my notes, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. Correct. Wonderful. Awesome. Then thank you all so much uh, for allowing me to join you today. Uh, my name is Salvador Munoz, and I'm the Director of Public Programs at Poster House. Uh, Poster House, if you haven't visited us yet, uh, please do stop by. We'd love to welcome you and show you around our little museum. Uh, but if you haven't visited us yet, uh, we are the first and only museum in the United States dedicated to the art and history of the poster. Uh, we're located on 119 West 23rd Street between 6th and 7th. Uh, and we are open uh, Thursday through Sunday from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, with free admission and extended hours every Friday till 9 p.m. Um, um, I'm here today to tell you a little bit about uh, our block party, uh, which we are hoping to host on Saturday, July 13th. Uh, this is our third annual block party. Uh, our first block party took place in 2022 in the Flatiron Plaza. Uh, we welcomed over 800 uh, visitors to our museum, which at the time was the highest attendance in poster house history. Uh, and we also saw thousands of pedestrian attendees in the Flatiron Plaza for this activation. Uh, our second block party took place uh, in 2023 at Pier 63 in Hudson River Park. And this was a part of West Side Fest. Uh, we welcomed over a thousand visitors to Poster House that day, breaking our previously set record, uh, as well as thousands of visitors at, at the pier. Um, so this year, uh, it is our five-year anniversary uh, for Poster House. Uh, so we wanted to make this year's block party extra special uh, by hosting it on 24th Street between 6th and 7th Abs, which is literally in our backyard. 
Um, this is just a little teaser that celebrates our fifth year anniversary, which we're all really excited about. Uh, before I get too uh, much into the weeds of what the details of the block party is, I thought it would be helpful to sort of ground uh, this in the goals of the block party. Um, and this is really meant to expand our reach uh, for the museum beyond our four walls um, and give us the opportunity to meet community members where they're at. Uh, we really wanna engage with our immediate community and the broader NYC community uh, and let them know that we're a local resource uh, for all New Yorkers to enjoy. <clears throat> Um, so activities at this year's block party will include uh, live music and dance performances, uh, poster printmaking and art making activities uh, hosted both by Poster House as well as other arts and culture organizations in the neighborhood. Games, prizes, and giveaways. Uh, our prize wheel at our first block party was a huge hit and we're excited to bring it back. Um, and of course, uh, children's activities and performances to engage our youngest visitors and patrons. Um, and last but certainly not least, uh, we will be offering free admission uh, all day during the block party, as well as all weekend long. Um, and uh, exhibition tours led by our curatorial mm -hmm. and design teams uh, mm -hmm. and much, much more uh, offerings still in development. Um, but how this may impact you and our local Chelsea community, we are asking to close 24th Street between 6th and 7th Abs uh, for the <laughs> day uh, on Saturday, July 13th. Uh, and we are also hoping to uh, implement amplified sound within city regulations uh, between the hours of 12 and 5 during the block party. Um, with a structure of 30 minute performances interrupted by about 15 minutes of talking uh, from our MC and host. Uh, so that concludes all of the presentation that I have, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions from the committee or the public. Great, thank you so much, Salvador. If, um, if you don't mind, just stop sharing your screen so we can see everybody. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, just as a reminder for all the committee members and anyone here in the public, our sort of standard format for Approaching presentations is it will first uh, just uh, have questions from any committee members to the presenter if there are any questions, and then uh, we'll take comments or questions from the public, and then we'll return just for committee discussion where we can share any points or uh, concerns that we have before we take a vote. So, uh, are there any questions for the presenter from the committee? Uh, go ahead. Um, it, uh, have you uh, posted to your neighbors? Have you gotten any feedback? Um, any uh, community or neighborhood outreach on 24th Street? It is, it is a lot of residents on the block. Yeah, so we did reach out to all of the block associations from the list provided by uh, CB4. Uh, and we met with a few representatives from different block organizations, all of whom have expressed excitement and interest in the uh, uh, program. Uh, and we're still open to meeting with any community members as we continue uh, to build towards this program. Uh, we've also reached out to all of the businesses that are on the block, um, many of whom we haven't heard back from, but those who we have heard back with have expressed um, excitement um, and are eager to be involved in the program. <clears throat> we have documentation and letters. Any anything from anybody? Here? Yeah, some we were, I'm not sure. Did you were, did you send any materials to to the committee before beforehand? Uh, just uh, uh, pictures documenting uh, your your posts and and the, any communication with with uh, the community, the block associations. Um, I'm not sure if we saw anything. Janine, did we receive anything? Um, no, I didn't share anything. I don't remember receiving anything. Salvador, did you? Send anything? Um, I didn't. We did post uh, on the light posts uh, for the uh, as specified by CD4. Um, and I have uh, records of all my email correspondence with the uh, block associations, and I'm happy to provide that uh, mm -hmm. right now. Yeah, that that would be it would be great if you if you don't mind just forwarding that on to us just so we have that in our records. <laughs> Thanks, sure. Uh, sure. So um, I can attest to seeing one of your signs this weekend um, on the sidewalk. So I actually took a picture of it. Uh, question regarding past venue spaces. What's the feedback from previous venues or spaces? 
that you had where you had your uh, um, yeah, we've had uh, overwhelmingly positive feedback from um, the venues that we've worked with in the past, and I'd be happy to put you in contact with any of them if you'd like to follow up. Uh, but we like to say we're in the business of making friends here at Poster House, so we always try to uh, be as respectful and communicative as possible with the people that we're partnering with. Uh, sorry, my questions are... I'll come up to his in terms of why would you change the, the location? <clears throat> Yeah, so uh, the back of our building exits onto 24th Street, and it actually will serve as an access point for the museum on the day of. Um, and because it's our fifth year anniversary, we really wanted to make it extra special. Uh, what we found last year was that Hudson River Park uh, was a little bit too far for us in terms of like transitioning from the block party element to the museum elements of the program. Uh, and for Hudson or and for the Flatiron Plaza, we just outgrew that space very quickly. Uh, with the with uh, the amount of visitors that we received from people walking by. Okay. Um, are you going to have any food? If so, you can charge for the food, or is it free? Or and also outside vendors selling things, or it's just um, in the uh, just museum stuff. Uh, so sorry, is the question uh, food vendors at the block party? The, the question was about whether you'll be, yeah, you'll have food vendors and whether it'll be free food or it'll be charged. Great question. Uh, so we work with an outside catering company who manages our cafe. And we're trying to see if they can have a presence uh, outside on the block party to, to sell food to patrons. Uh, and then we're also looking at possibly bringing in an ice cream <clears throat> truck to really uh, celebrate uh, to capture that New York City block party feel. Uh, don't worry, it will not be playing music during the time. It's going to be quiet, but people will have the opportunity to purchase uh, uh, sweet treats on the day of. Um, and so, yes, we are, are hoping uh, to uh, incorporate some opportunities for food and beverage as well. And one of the activities are going to be on the block party on vendors. Uh, sorry, is the question about what are the activities going to be for the day? Correct. Right. Uh, yeah, so we're going to have a variety of printmaking activities, uh, including screen printing, uh, where you can print your own fan um, to keep you cool throughout the day and also dry the prints as you wave it. Uh, print your own poster on an actual letterpress printing machine. Um, and then we're also asking some of our uh, local <laughs> community partners and arts and culture organizations to contribute activities that they'll design as well. Uh, we'll, be do we'll be doing a special poster kids activity, which is our monthly uh, program designed for children under the age of 12. Uh, we'll also have a Lego block printing activity for, uh, that's designed to target more teens and uh, young, young adults. Uh, we'll also have a wheat paste wall, which is a freestanding wall where you can uh, paste up a poster <laughs> like a professional, uh, all kinds of different activities to engage with. Oh, sounds like trouble to me. Uh, no, 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 Christine. <laughs> so I have the two security issues. One, uh, not an issue, a question. Uh, the barricade at the entrances, who is going to man the barricade? Is the police going to do that? Are you doing that? What's up? Uh, great question. So we will be, uh, uh, we have a security team uh, that we work with internally for our museum itself. Uh, and then we'll also be contracting with an external security vendor to provide additional support throughout the day uh, to monitor the barricades. Um, and they're a company that we contracted and licensed, bonded, and have worked with in the past. And on the block, you are going to leave the 15 foot uh, lane for the fire department? Correct. Okay, and uh, so my, my main concern is the music from, you know, from 12 to five. Um, I mean, can we do anything about that? That you can, you stop, you do for, you know, half an hour and then you stop and I think the neighbors could, uh, you know, be a little bit overwhelmed. Yeah, so we are planning to do live music, a mix of live musical and dance performances, which will have like an audio element. Uh, the timing that we're looking at is 12 to five, uh, but we're asking for 30 minute sets uh, that are then interspersed with more 
conversational uh, updates from our MC, sort of promoting the different vendors and activities that we'll have throughout the day. So it's not going to be five hours of continuous music. But you don't want to have in between the music. You don't want to have somebody, you know, screaming on the on the loudspeaker saying, "Why don't you come and do something?" But it's, I'm talking about quiet time, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, we are. I'm sorry. I, I'm I'm failing to understand the question. What I'm saying, you're saying that you're going to do thirty minutes of music, and then you have an MC with which you talk to everybody. Well, an MC who talks is loud. And so can what can you do to make that section segment a little bit uh, quieter? Right. So the MC is not going to be talking for that entire 15 minute period. They're more so going to be basically serving as a distraction so that we can switch over the stage for the next act. So they're really only going to be talking for about five minutes of that 15 minute transitional period. Um, so just uh, making sure that the event is sort of like running seamlessly um but they're not going to be you know yammering on for 15 straight minutes and trying so to go full time they're just 20... going to be facilitating yeah. the event you, you're going to have 25 minutes essentially where it's quieter and then the music comes back right uh 15 minutes yeah 15 minutes, 15 minutes between sets so um, and and 12 to 5 is the right you said is the only five times <laughs> correct yeah right um, do we have any other questions Just from one? Yeah. One quick question. Do you know that you had a colleague with the police department in terms of sort of clothing and whatnot? Uh, sorry. Can you, the question... Question... can you hear me now? Uh, can you yeah. repeat the question? Sorry. The question is, uh, have you already coordinated with the police department? Uh, we have not started coordination with the police department yet, but we that is the next step in the process. All right, we're going to open up to any members of the public. If there's anyone here who to speak on uh, this first uh, item, the application by the Poster House for a block party on 24th Street, uh, please raise your hand and Jamie will move you into the panelist section to, to speak uh, or ask a question. Okay. Yeah, we're bringing Phyllis over. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I just have, I'm a big fan of the poster house. I visit it a lot. Um, and I think it's a great idea, but I have a question about where the stage is going to be located for the performances. Maybe it's going to be located on a certain area of the block that is less residential. Yeah, great question. We are taking that into account as we build out our site plan. Um, and oh, hi, Phyllis. Thank you for being a fan of Poster House. Always love to hear that. Uh, we are taking that into account as we build out our site plan. Right now, what the ideal spot that we're looking at is the, the vacant lot uh, and using that uh, to sort of occupy the stage uh, to do the least amount of disruption as possible. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Okay, I'll, I'll save my comment. For anyone else from the public? Great. All right, that closes the public portion of the, this uh, presentation. So now just for our, our own discussion, how we feel about this, any concerns we have, uh, obviously, I, I, I'll just kick it off. I think, you know, this will be a really great addition to our community for a day. It sounds like a lot of fun. The poster house is awesome, and I would love to make quite some screen and prints myself. Obviously, noise, I think, is the, the main, you know, one of the main concerns here. I think we could and, and should request. Um, I, I don't think I realized that the site plan hadn't been fully developed yet. So perhaps, um, you know, we ask of Salvador that when they're designing the site plan, that uh, uh, the direction of the speakers and the direction of the stage is the, the, that should be their primary concern about making sure that it is the speakers are pointed in direction, not at any particular residential building, but uh, down the street um, it would, be my, would be my request. Uh, to put in our letter of approval, but but that would be it for me. And then the, the 15 minutes oh, right. or, or 20 minutes. Yeah, just a little, a little break between the sets, just so if our neighbors are home that day and taking care of family or children, they get a little bit of respite from the music, uh, would be appreciated. 
Uh, I, I certainly agree with the co-chair on, on his remarks, uh, but having been uh, presented um, at a previous um, uh, committee that I sat on, uh, we found folks have to be very community-oriented, uh, very concerned with their image in the community, so I would say that uh, whatever recommendations we make, they'll take back to heart, and I'm sure it would be a great idea. Okay. Right. Yeah, I'm just two th two things. I mean, I all looks, I think all looks fine and all. Um, <clears throat> just a couple of things. One, I, you know, I need support. I think needs to be obviously contingent on you know making sure we get the positive feedback or support from the community. So when it gets the full board, that's yep, that's all care. take care of. Uh, and the other thing is just you know my just feeling about this. Um, yeah, they are they are a they are a nonprofit, so it's. Um, so I think we need to just make note of this that this isn't a for-profit operation. Um, so we're not setting a precedent that anyone can say, hey, we've been here at our location for five years, 10 years. We want to have a party and, it, and, it's, and it's marketing for a for-profit. So um, if it weren't a nonprofit, I, I would have a very different feeling about this. Okay. Anybody, any other comments? All right, so just to sum up our discussion and, and uh, Salvador, just make sure that this is okay with you. We, it seems like we are ready to vote to approve the following stipulations or agreements from you. Uh, one, you'll forward us uh, proof of your you know, outreach to the Block Association and your correspondence with them just so that we can see before we get to the full board, you know, that or and our full, all, for, all, excuse me, our full community board uh, can rest assured that um, the, the Block Associations uh, are aware of this and support it. Um, two, um, uh, that you will um, uh, provide us a site plan uh, and in eventually, and in the site plan, uh, you will uh, take into account the direction of the noise and direction of speakers when uh, making your choice of, of uh, where the stage is going to be. Uh, three, that you'll have breaks in between sets of 15 minutes uh, uh, so that um, music is not blaring for the entire 12 to 5 period. And somewhere in the letter, we will note that uh, this is a nonprofit, um, and uh, to, to you know to call attention to that fact uh, and stress it in our approval, so that it is not setting precedent for commercial for profit uh, entities. All right, with all those, uh, can we get a motion? Motion. Like a second. second. All those in favor? Yeah. Anyone opposed? President not eligible, abstaining. Awesome, uh, Salvador passes. Uh, thank you very much. Really looking forward to it. Uh, obviously, it still needs to go to the full board, but I think it should be fine. Uh, and it sounds like it's gonna be a great and fun day. Thank you so much. Wonderful, thank you so much for having me. Great. Have a good night. All right, moving along to our second item, uh, the presentation for our intercity bus stop application for Klein bus service. Uh, on 11th Avenue between uh, 35th and 36th Streets. Uh, do we have uh, the presenters uh, for Klein Bus Service with us? I think I saw Larry. Hey, Larry, how you doing? We just, oh, I see Larry, multiple Larrys, but I see multiple presenters. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave you guys to it. Uh, take it away. Uh, the floor is yours. Okay, um, good evening, everyone. Um, in the interest of reducing traffic to uh, Manhattan, Klein is proposing that we have runs from Eastern Pennsylvania up to Manhattan on a daily basis. Uh, we're looking at running three buses per day. Um, those buses were full. That would reduce uh, 168 cars per day going into Manhattan. We picked a location to drop off that is very, very close to the Lincoln Tunnel. So we would be coming into the city, uh, looping around, dropping off, and uh, then we're less than a quarter mile from the exit to exit the city back out the Lincoln Tunnel. Uh, this is a location uh, that is across the street from the uh, Jacob Javits Center. Uh, it's very convenient to the subway, to different forms of transportation. So once the passengers get into the city, they can then take public transportation to get to wherever they need to go. There are currently other buses that stop at the location that we're requesting. So we're not going to be uh, adding a, a new bus stop. 
We're just going to be adding one, uh, additional buses to the bus stop that's already there. We've already checked the schedules of the buses that are coming to those stops, and our proposed stop and pickup times do not interfere with those buses whatsoever. Okay. Um, Sorry, is that, is that it? Yeah. Are you finished? Or I didn't, I didn't mean to cut you off. Um, that's uh, pretty much all I have for right now. I'd like to open it up to questions. I think we have, a, I think we have information we need. Uh, yes, great. We'll open it to questions. Uh, David? How many times a day, and is it going to be seven days a week, including holidays? Single time. What is that? <laughs> yeah, just to make uh, the committee aware, we did receive uh, mm -hmm. uh, their stipulation form. Uh, it should be in the drop box uh, mm -hmm. if, you, if you can review it as, as we go. Uh, sorry, Larry, I'll let you answer. That's okay. Um, we're see. looking at running um, three buses a day up there. Uh, or, uh, there are two in the morning and then one later on in the late afternoon for people that want to come back at the end of the day. Great. Uh, yeah. What's the time gap between the buses, your company and the existing company that's there? Time gap. Uh, when I looked, they run approximately a, a half hour to 45 minutes between when we're there and when there's another company they're picking up at the same location. So you have 5, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes between... 45 minutes. 45 minutes? <clears throat> yeah, a half hour to 45 minutes is what I saw on most of the pickups, yes. Anybody else? Uh, Brett? Um, what's your plan for having any, any uh, of your staff on the sidewalk to make sure that passengers are staying orderly in the sidewalk and allowing for, for the free flow of other, passive, of other pedestrians, including the pedestrians that will be going to and from the Javits Center on the busy, busy conversion day. I, I'm, I'm sorry, there's a pretty heavy echo in there. I, I think I heard, uh, uh, what is our plan to keep customers orderly there? Is that is that what I heard? In a way that, that keeps the sidewalk congestion free during, uh, especially during peak times when there are active conventions across the street and people coming and going from the Javits Center. We're actually across the street from the Javits Center on the other side of the street. Um, we have been we've been uh, looking at that location for some time now because we do have buses that come up to the city uh, on a regular basis, uh, tour type buses that drop off for the day for people visiting into New York City. And we did a lot of homework and looked around at uh, areas that would be very bus friendly for dropping off and picking up. And it seems like that area across the street from the Javits Center uh, is usually always open. Um, the sidewalk on the side of the Javits Center does get very full from time to time, but across the street, it stays fairly open. Right. No, correct. But what, I, what I'm asking is at the times when you're expecting your, your customers to be waiting for a bus, um, and presumably lining up on the sidewalk, what's your plan to make sure that the customers will not be causing congestion on the sidewalk? Okay. Are you, um, sorry, are you, are you, yeah. you, <laughs> are you going to have a uh, kind of stanchion so that your customer line up against the wall? Um, um, in the past, in the past, when we have made runs up to New York City uh, for picking up and dropping off, um, the customers generally show up five to ten minutes before the bus gets there. We do not have, we rarely, rarely have people waiting around for a long period of time. So the people tend to show up, get on the bus, and we pull out and leave. We rarely see large crowds, more than a handful of people standing there and waiting. You, you didn't answer my question. My question was, are you going to have some stanchion to uh, line up the customers? I'm, I'm not really sure. Um, are, are you saying put up some sort of fences or something like that so the people line up? Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, so before the, the uh, uh, company that used that space, before you bought, they had little uh, chains uh, attached to stanchions and, and it was like a line, you know, uh, and people would line up there. So if you could do that, that would be very nice. She said, I, uh, I guess I guess we could. Uh, we could put some sort of uh, fencing or gates or chains or something up. Um, I do know there are buses that already pick up there, and there is no problem with what with the buses that are currently picking up. But if you would need some sort of chains or something to be put up there, we could we could put those up. Yes, that would be great. Uh, any other questions? What about yeah. idling? Do you, uh, yeah, what, I what are you doing about idling? Uh, when your your drivers arrive to either drop off or pick up, are they instructed to turn off their engine right away? Yes, they in, they are instructed to turn the engines off immediately as soon as they stop the bus. After okay. all of the passengers are unloaded. Um, we are not to sit there at that location. If we have a uh, 35 or 40 minute wait time before the time we have to come and pick those passengers up, we will move the buses to a non-MTA parking. Does, oh, go ahead. So we I move the bus to another, lo another location and then come back when it's time to pick up and uh, leave the city. So when you come back and pick up, at what time do they turn on their engine? Let's say you are there, the, uh, they come back at quarter to nine, at quarter to nine, making it up. And, uh, and, and uh, they, they are supposed to leave at nine. At what time will they turn on their engine, especially in the summer? Uh, we start the engines at one minute before nine o'clock. We do not idle. There's a law in New York City about idling for anything more than three minutes. All of our... Uh, Drivers are instructed to not run their engines uh, until it's time to pull out and leave. Very good. We're very happy with that. <laughs> that's, that's, that's usually the kind of public commitment that we're looking for with these kind of questions. Thank you. Uh, we're, happy, we're happy for that also because there's a $1,000 fine if we get caught uh, idling more than three minutes. Um, all right. Uh, any other questions from the committee? Uh, I'm turning to members of the public. Anyone have questions, comments, concerns on this application for a uh, bus stop at uh, 11th Avenue, on 11th Avenue between 35th and 36th? All right, seeing none, uh, turning out to uh, conversation, uh, you know, I think we'll throw in our usual tips about, you know, even though uh, obviously, it is it is law to not idle. We like to have it in writing, nonetheless, and we always appreciate the public commitment that lives on YouTube forever. Uh, and uh, uh, do we have any other? Uh, I, I also think the, the the lineup. I mean, it's not a fence that we're talking about. It's those, you know, what are they? Two, two, like little, little, chains, little chains, chains, plastic chains that go between, just to signify to people that you know you can line up here. Um, uh, that's usually best, uh, just so that it's not a clump of. We need to find the, the right word. Yes, we will find the right word for what those things are. Okay. What is the right word? What is it? Stanchion. Stanchion. Right oh, all right. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe he should coordinate it with the other buses since it doesn't seem like they're using. Well, let's let's. Let's have them do do it yeah. first. And, you know, let's the make sure that they don't take it down. Right. Or, um, okay. Anything else from otherwise? It sounds fine. Love that way. Crossing Javits. Not okay. usually a problem area for us. All right. Uh, uh, so the, the old just well, just to make sure that you you agree at least you know the, the non idling as you already committed and uh, the the sanctions uh, you agree these these be good. <clears throat> Great. Uh, in that case, do we have a motion? <laughs> Do we have a second? Uh, very great. All those in favor of this business application? Great. Anyone opposed? Present not eligible, abstaining. Excellent. Thank you so much. Fine Good transportation. Uh, really appreciate it. Have a good night. And we'll all right. You guys. Thank you. All right. Our third item on the agenda is an issue brought to our attention by a community member, Jonathan Wiseman on uh, congestion issues on 15th Street and 9th Avenue and its impact on the M11 bus route. Uh, so we're going to have Jonathan uh, speak 
uh, to us about what he's seen and uh, perhaps we can brainstorm on some uh, potential solutions. Uh, if we agree that there's a problem, uh, a brainstorm on some potential solutions uh, that we can submit to DOT. So uh, Jonathan, if you're with us, I see you. Yes, I'm here. Right there, there you go. You're literally right there. Uh, great. Okay. <laughs> I haven't left. I've been here since the I've been here since the beginning. So, uh, I just want to thank everybody on the committee and the board and all you guys do for the work for the community. Uh, it's very very uh, thankful. So, I just wanted to kind of raise the question, not raise the question, but look to the committee for help uh, and also work with DOT and the committee to find a solution. Uh, you know, I take the M11 bus a lot. And I've realized in the most most recent two or three years, it seems like at the around 18th Street, it seems like the congestion starts. Uh, and it kind of always feels to me that it always leads around the area of 15th Street and 9th Avenue. Um, so what I've noticed over the years, I know that the Open Street program, very, very good program. And I think that's good to stay. But I think maybe some improvements in the area um, where in front of the Chelsea market, it seems like there is a lane that is dedicated for people to make a right turn on 15th Street. And it seems a little bit blocked always with Uber drivers and taxi drivers just lining up to pick people up and drop people off, as well as people double parking at between 15th and 16th. And then also the pressure, I think, of going from you know, four lanes to three lanes to two lanes where 14th Street continues southbound uh, towards Hudson. Um, it seems like also that pressure of just narrowing down to two lanes, which is normal, which is fine. But uh, to maybe alleviate or find a solution with the committee uh, and the Department of Traffic and trying to find a way to maybe sequence the lights uh, at 14th Street and Hudson and 9th or uh, maybe even uh, working on creating a do not walk sign where people, where the cars can turn at 15th Street uh, at a certain point. So alleviating a little bit, people turning onto 15th from going from 9th to 10th Avenue. So I'm just looking to try to find a solution with you guys uh, and DOT and open the discussion to see how we can alleviate a little bit the pressure and maybe help the M11 bus move a little bit quicker through that neighborhood, not faster, but just quicker, obviously watching pedestrian safety uh, and all the other matters, uh, you know, then the speed limit, but just making sure that we kind of find a solution to that. So I just wanted to bring that to the attention of the board uh, and the committee and see how we can present that to the Department of Traffic. Okay. Uh, Charlie, I see you're signed in. Do you mind throwing up the street view for us? No uh, problem. You got it already. Yeah. So Usually should, our man for that. Thank you very much. I, I apologize Jesse, for not bringing that up. Jesse and I had a meeting, you know, with uh, Jonathan, mm -hmm. and we kind of dug into it to try to understand. Mm -hmm. what Correct. Was, when Correct. Talking about, so we we uh, um, we we have, you know, developed some ideas, but. You want to hear it. Yeah, I think it's actually the so if you turn it around, it's right. There. So it really starts here. Right there. Yeah. Like traffic. This is August 2022, just in case. Yeah, but okay. actually, I think if you move from what I remember, if you move up uh, uptown uh, and turn around, the, the image will update. But keep going, keep going, keep going. No, <laughs> there we go. There's the chest. Right. Well, they look sound to you, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, our understanding, right, is that all these drivers sort of back up here on the right uh, in front of Chelsea Market. And is, that, is the bus using the left two lanes to go straight? I think the bus is using the, goes down the, right. Right. the bus is using the M11 stays to the left in those two lanes to the left that, and next to towards the T Mobile store and continues southbound. <laughs> Correct. Um, but what ends up happening is because of the buildup on the outside of Chelsea Market, it sort of leads into the left lanes, causing causing congestion. Is our understanding? Um, yeah, that so and, I, and I and just and I think it was made at the suggestion. Again, I'm I'm not making any uh, 
But you see where that car at 15th Street is about to make a right turn. You know, pedestrians are crossing and it's a little bit dangerous. But if there's a way to sequence it to let maybe the flow of traffic go for like 15 seconds so they can make a right and then the lights can switch over. So, you know, just to alleviate a little bit the pressure, because it seems like all the cars overload right in front of Chelsea factory to make a right turn onto that street, 15 so, street. So that corner on 15 and 9, pure on 15th street, the volume of pedestrians, mm -hmm. first of all, coming up and going down is huge. High. And yeah. They are crossing all the time. So if they are crossing all the time, then the cars come down, right? So... Um, so I think if we had, like they did on 8th Avenue, for the same situation, right, to make to make a um, an exclusive split face signal mm -hmm. where people would say, all right, this is just the pedestrian, and then it's just the cars. And so when it's just the cars, the pedestrian would have the red light, if they have red, you know, no, no walking. And then you can have really the cars flowing through. So that I think that would alleviate a little bit. Where, where is the new study? On between 30, 34 and uh, 40. Mm. They have done that everywhere where they have done the uh, the, the super sidewalk. Right. It's, they, a, it's a left turn in that situation. Right. Like it, it's, it's a right, right turn. turn. Right. Um, just for yeah. efficiency of all well, just for efficiency of this this particular topic conversation since it's not an official presentation, I think everyone should just feel free to share I mean, if you have questions, do questions, if you have ideas, mm -hmm. uh, ideas. Uh, Christine does have a list that maybe makes sense just for her to also just read out the list of, of solutions to the problem. But if, but if there are questions first, or, you know, if you... If you so is this about the cars moving along on night, or... Yes. I, know on the, I was just affecting... This is know. about the cars moving on night, right. and then uh, 15th Street being, being backed up, right. so you can't go, mm -hmm. and then cars trying to turn on 15, and they can't go on 15. Right. So now you have... Everything happening right there. Yeah. yeah so how is it affecting the M11? Because the M11 is going down like that. Yeah, the because the, is going down. Yeah, the M11. So the traffic all backs okay. up, and then you have cars double parking in front of. Yeah, sorry yeah. to interrupt anybody. I'm oh, sorry no, to interrupt. No, no, no. It's not like that. Actually, it's great for for 13 minutes. Which yeah. is why. Right. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I caught that. Right. Exactly. Right. Uh, I got you. Okay. Just, just, okay. Just, just a quick thing to Christine, what you're saying about having lights only for the car versus right. the pedestrian. Unfortunately, pedestrians don't follow. Uh, but that uh, helps. Because then you that, have the cars that, help. that helps a lot. I can see it on Eighth Avenue where people are just crossing all the time, and when the light changes, you know, it's like okay, you're not supposed to walk. People are not sure whether the cars are coming across, and therefore, and especially there because we have a lot of tourists there, right, coming to that corner. Mm -hmm. we'll start about that. Uh, David. Uh, you say the cars are being done apart. I think maybe if we send tow trucks every once in a while, that would eliminate the That's all right. Yeah. 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 I was, I was always going to say this should be forwarded to the, the, the CB4 Vigilante Committee. No, no, no. <laughs> but, yeah. um, no what you say, I mean, like, you know, maybe like once every two weeks, a tow truck comes by. You are in charge of making yeah. it yeah. happen. Yeah. Yeah. They're not throwing a fucking heat in the car, they're just dropping people off. No, there is a taxi. Taxi stand. There is a taxi stand in front of children. Yeah, you, can see, you can see that they are two lanes. So oh, they are, there is a taxi stand, mm -hmm. and I'm sure they are taxi double, you know. Double parking, mm -hmm. but you have a second lane which is supposed to turn. Yeah, hey, there it is, no parking. So it's standing fine, probably, but no parking. So what um, you probably could do is, if we, I mean, if it's just CC on the letter, NYPD can do the events. The worst they can do is ignore us, not can even cause us a problem. Well, the the bid, the new packing bid, is very sensitive to keep Chelsea yeah. Market happy. Right. So <laughs> it's given away not I'd rather find solutions that are not given We need, to, we need to navigate term. we need to navigate that whole situation. But yeah. we are not the bid, we are the community. I know. Are, yeah. All right, I'm gonna I'll pause this. Right, right. Um so and I don't know if Google has enough money to do this, but um because they're just a startup, but um <laughs> if they're gonna you know they I'm sure they, they got you know, I had to put in a request to get that loading and unloading done in front of the building, which most buildings don't have. Right. Um, it seems like one, we need to get um, a condition attached to the continued usage or allowance for such a sign that 
Google should have somebody out front to direct traffic to make sure there aren't people double parking and loading and unloading. That's a good idea. Like in front of an airport. Like in front of an airport. Yeah. Um, that, so that's the first thing. The other thing, you know, I was, I was thinking split bays, but then I'm going back to my favorite intersection at 8th and 31st, where they're about the last fall. <laughs> 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 Someone's, someone's not on I don't think. Right, it's on me. I think you're zero. No, no, no. Okay. Um, mine looks like yeah. Yeah. it's not right. Yeah. Um, so the issue happens back then. It's much like myself. I think you are. No, no. Yeah, yeah. Here. Yeah, I, uh, uh, we did what? Yeah. Oh, no, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So that would be a collection, you know, what we could do is have a collection, I mean, I mean yeah. spend a letter and say, please study how to improve this section. And here are some suggestions that you could study. And then it gets done. It's always a nice backstop to just ask DOT to study it, but it's well, it's great that we can come in come right. with a bunch of suggestions. Um, and uh, it sounds like we had got at least one more suggestion uh, about, you know, that we can see CC somebody. Google right. on this letter and uh, uh, ask them to, to have someone, you know, out front. Um, uh, is there any, uh, is it, anyone else? Is yeah. it Google that has requested the loading zone or is it the Chelsea market itself? Probably Chelsea. Because I, I imagine it's a good point. It's Chelsea market that yeah, it, we might have to look into the that is, that is, yeah, having like delivery trucks. That's probably, that's probably a good point. So no, but they have these people. Yeah. We're just we're just getting people to the... dropped up, people picked up. Yeah, it's yeah. it's yeah. mostly yeah. people. It's yeah. mostly yeah. people in front. It's not in the room to let passengers out on any road. Like legally, like if, uh, do you need to request the loading zone for that? Well, if you want to be against the 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 curb. Yeah. Like know. normally if you're just on a road, you don't need to like have a special No, but no, but if there is a park, you can do the parking there instead. Oh, uh, people would be parking if there is not if there's not a drop off. Yeah, we were friends built because they own the building. Right. Um you can Google it. Or we think it's like a clarification of Google owns terms. That's well, that yeah. great. Yeah. Um, so uh, before we finish this conversation up here, is there anyone from the public, any member of the public who is here to speak on this particular topic? I can't see. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, seeing no one. Um, uh, any other comments, questions for the committee? But it, uh, just to sum up, it just sounds like we are sending, uh, just said, sending letter to DOT, CC, and Google. Uh, and me packing. And me packing bid, uh, mm -hmm. uh, with some several ideas on uh, how to improve the traffic flow at this particular corner, um, including uh, uh, you know in the long, some longer term solutions, and also perhaps having an employee uh, actually there to to sort of keep traffic moving along the sidewalk. Um, but uh, otherwise, you know, also asking DOT to to study and look into it, um, and raising this uh, raising this to their attention. Um, so that's the letter we're going to write. Yeah. Uh, is there a motion? Motion. Second? Second. Okay. All those in favor? All right. All right. No opposed. President on eligible. All right. Now we're moving on Thank to you. the. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're moving on to the meat of the evening. Um, so. Uh, uh, before, I'm just going to tee up uh, the, next, the next few items here. Um, so, uh, as everyone knows, we have a, a we are uh, we are accustomed to at this point uh, having applications for street co namings. Um, uh, we uh, uh, typically set a pretty high bar, a pretty high threshold for approving such applications, but we still uh, obviously hear everyone out and everyone who's gone out and gotten 150 signatures to uh, to come before us, um, and uh, we look forward to those presentations. There are going to be. Uh, uh, if you see uh, uh, item number four is a, a, a discussion for the guidelines. Uh, our our community board four guidelines are currently in the Dropbox. I think everyone should, as we move through this discussion, have them uh, in front of you so that you have a point of reference for your questions or comments. Uh, uh, and these guidelines were obviously sent to the applicants, and, and the applicants should be familiar with them. Um, uh, that being said, um, part after we hear from the two applicants and we vote uh, separately on, on each applicant, uh, uh, Christine and I thought it also made sense to have a brief conversation about if we still think that these guidelines make sense based on all of the applications that we have received over the previous years and our conversation, and whether there are certain adjustments we want to make either about the threshold about uh, coming before us or about other uh, language that we have <clears throat> in here. Um, so we're going to save that conversation for after we hear the two presentations, um, but uh, I would suggest that you have that in the back of your mind as we talk through these, um, because perhaps there are certain qualifications uh, that don't do or don't make the guidelines right now, but could in the future if we adjusted the guidelines. So uh, with uh, uh, that all being said, um, I'm happy to uh, uh, pass it over to our first presentation for a street co-naming, our first application for a street co-naming, excuse me. This is for the corner of uh, 25th Street and 8th Avenue in honor of the rock band KISS. Uh, and I believe uh, we have a, a, a certain amount of community interest in this particular application. And so I'm looking forward to what should be a fruitful discussion. Um, and so um, I, I would 
Sorry, I'm forgetting. Oh, Michael, I believe, is here to present uh, on this application. So uh, take it away, Michael. I appreciate it. Just to give a correction, it's uh, 23rd Street and 8th Avenue, the southwest oh, corner. Thank you. Thank you. That's very helpful. So there's a typo in our agenda. One's 23rd and 8th. Well, you wanted the best, and you got the best. Presenting the hottest band in the world, KISS. From the petition signatures obtained, there has been a lot of support from the Chelsea community and the KISS Army. I want to thank the community board for the opportunity to discuss this proposal. Next slide. My name is Michael, and I'm a lifelong New Yorker and longtime KISS fan. Last September, I attended the unveiling of Beastie Boys Square. The Beastie Boys were honored on the corner of Rivington and Ludlow for their music career and their iconic album cover, Paul's Boutique. The event was amazing. A 10 foot tall boombox, a DJ playing Beastie Boys tracks, and even exclusive merchandise to commemorate the occasion. Surviving members, Mike D and Ad Rock were there for the ceremony. It was such a wonderful experience, it helped to inspire me to honor another New York legendary artist, KISS. Next slide, please. Now regarding honorary street signs, hip hop is well represented. Notorious B.I.G., Run DMC, Wu-Tang Clan, and of course the Beastie Boys have been honored all over the five boroughs. I feel it would be fitting for New York City to honor more of its rock legacy by naming a street after KISS. Next slide. Now KISS have become rock icons, mesmerizing audiences for 50 years. The band was started by four New Yorkers who wanted to create the band of their dreams. Pyrotechnics, fireworks, dazzling outfits, makeup and rock music merged to create a true extravaganza. Each member's makeup style are also recognizable worldwide. 30 gold records and 100 million albums sold. They are the most successful American rock band of all time. Next slide. Their charitable contributions are also as legendary as their stage shows. KISS has partnered with the Wounded Warrior Project, the Boys and Girls Club, Children's Hospitals, benefit fundraisers, just to name a few. And a local example was their involvement with the Cerebral Palsy Telethon in Manhattan. Next slide. <clears throat> this has also inspired and influenced many musical artists, Metallica, Guns N' Roses, Nirvana, Red Hot Chili Peppers, Foo Fighters, to even Garth Brooks and Lady Gaga have credited Kiss as an inspiration. Next slide. Last December, KISS concluded their 50-year career of live performances. Their end-of-the-road tour had their last two concerts at Madison Square Garden, their hometown arena. It was an amazing experience as the band took over New York City. Pop-up merchandise stores, branded taxis, exclusive New York Post newspapers, and even KISS Metro cards were created for their final bow. Next slide. KISS both started and ended their career as a New York band. Paul Stanley was born in Manhattan and worked as a taxi driver serving the Chelsea area. He always mentions driving customers to Madison Square Garden to see Elvis Presley. Gene Simmons, an immigrant who grew up in New York City and was also a school teacher, truly experienced the American dream story. Ace Fraley was born in the Bronx and his cover of the song New York Groove has become an anthem for the city. Peter Chris, born in Brooklyn, whose previous band was coincidentally named Chelsea, was a driving force behind not only the drums, but their classic ballad, Beth. Next slide. Speaking of Chelsea, the neighborhood was the setting for the birthplace of Kiss. The address 10 East 23rd Street was where Kiss not only rented a loft, but they also auditioned Ace Fraley by way of them placing an ad in the Village Voice. There they practiced, rehearsed, and perfected songs from their early catalog. They also developed their makeup and outfits in that very building. Next slide. 
Not only is 23rd Street and 5th Avenue important in history, but also the southwest corner of 23rd Street and 8th Avenue, which is why I am here today. On October 26, 1974, the band assembled with legendary photographer Bob Bruin to take photos, which would be used for an article in Cream Magazine. Dressed in business suits, they walked around the Chelsea area, then proceeded to wear their kiss attire, similar to Clark Kent transforming into Superman. <laughs> the photo shot on that very corner would later be used by Kiss for their third album, Dressed to Kill. Their famous anthem, Rock and Roll All Night, was also on that record. Uh, next slide. This corner has become New York's Abbey Road and has inspired fans to visit that corner for almost 50 years. Like the Beatles album, fans recreate the image, even placing their foot on the light post, just like Ace Frehley. Next slide. With everything discussed regarding KISS and their strong connections to the Chelsea area, I feel it would be a great honor to co-name the southwest corner of 23rd Street and 8th Avenue as KISS Corner. At this corner, you could walk down 23rd Street to visit their loft or head up 8th Avenue to Madison Square Garden, where they performed for decades. Next March will be the 50th anniversary of the album. As was the case with the Beastie Boys, Fans and the community would love to have a big celebration mm -hmm. in conjunction with the street sign unveiling. We would invite the band and photographer Bob Bruin to attend the occasion. We also can collaborate with local Chelsea businesses, including the pizzeria Lions, Tigers, and Squares. Their business is right across the street from the corner and not only serving Detroit-style pizza, but also displaying the Kiss-inspired movie, Detroit Rock City. Next slide. In conclusion, Kiss Corner will honor New York City's most successful rock band. They were inducted in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and have a Hollywood star. Now it's time for New York to step up to the plate. The sign will not only cement the corner's cultural significance, but will be a benefit to local businesses with tourism to the area. And I actually have a letter of support from Barcade, which is a local restaurant there in the Chelsea area, and they wrote, Barcade supports the renaming of the corner of 23rd Street and 8th Avenue to Kiss Corner. As a local business, we appreciate anything that will help to attract people to visit the area. There is also going to be an upcoming Kiss biopic in development, which will heavily promote and feature the 23rd Street area, which this could also be in conjunction with the street sign event. Next slide. So let's shout it out loud, support Kiss Corner, and let's make history. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Michael. Uh, and you have some, some applause here from, from the public uh, that is here with you uh, uh, this evening. So um, uh, just uh, before we go to discussion, uh, also to remind the committee members that there are uh, letters of both support and against in the Dropbox from, from community members. Um, I am going to ask that we try to keep this in a structured conversation. So just starting with questions for the applicant, and then we'll open it up to the public, and then we'll discuss. But just questions now for the applicant. Thank you. Um, first of all, it says um, person must have been now regarding the person that must have an extraordinary record of public service to the community, the state, city, or country of the world. What public service have they done? And my second question is, could you elaborate on what involved what they had with the wounded warriors because that they, they have a check in history with the wounded warriors so i'd like to know details of what well the service to the country is their musical contribution and the arts kiss was like the beatles of the 1970s they influenced generations of musical artists after them from the 80s the 90s the 2000s so many people no, say ace freely I'm not talking about the music, I'm talking about actual public service that directly affects the Chelsea community and what they've done, it's specifically in Chelsea as a public service, specific charity on the set, like the St. Louis Soup Kitchen, <clears> something <throat> like that. Yeah, a lot of their charities are on a national scale or they're in other states or you know in other countries. I did give a local example as far as the Cerebral Palsy Telethon, which is in Manhattan. 
and they were part of the Jerry Lewis telethon in the past. So throughout their history, they've always done charitable causes. But I think as far as with the Chelsea uh, connection, it's really about their history. And it's about Chelsea saying that we have a rock history and an important music scene that we want to show and honor for the country and the world, uh, just like all these other neighborhoods have honored their hip hop history or doo-wop or yeah. uh, other kinds of music. Thanks, Michael. Uh, other questions? Uh, no, no, from, sorry, from our committee. And then we'll go in front of the public. Thanks. Uh, yeah, what uh, contributions uh, did KISS make before their existence in this community? In the well, I was community. saying that Paul Stanley was a taxi cab driver, so he was serving customers in the Chelsea area. As I mentioned, he uh, mentions this whenever he's playing Madison Square Garden, that he would drive people in his cab to Madison Square Garden to see Elvis. And he would say to himself, one day people are going <clears> to <throat> see me. One day people are going to see Kiss at Madison Square Garden. I'm going to be that star. So he had that dream and the whole band worked hard to make it a reality. So that's just one example is his previous yeah. occupation. Uh, thank you, Michael. Thank you for that passionate uh, presentation. Um, are you representing just yourself and some individuals, or is there um, a fan club, a national fan club that's involved with this in any way? I'm simply just representing myself as a fan. I attended the BC Boys event, and then with the KISS events coming a few months after that, it just gave me the idea and the inspiration that, well, KISS should have you know a street named after them because of its importance. And if we're already going to honor all these other musical artists like we already have in the city, that why not do more of our rock music history? There's a lot of rock history for New York, and it's not really represented that well with the street signings as it is with other musical genres. So it's just an idea that I had in my head. It was a dream, and then I pursued it to try to make it a reality. Oh, my other question, considering the presentation, I mean, they were there on the corner and took some pictures, but it seems to me that there's more activity over on Fifth Avenue on Fifth and 22nd Street. Um, why did you pick this as opposed to someplace where they started their their uh, their music and then developed themselves? Uh, over there, we're here, they just came and took a photo, which I'm sure they used to promote themselves. So, well, can, I, can I ask as a corollary to that? And you know, but it's just how, how, right, how um, connected is this particular corner to Kiss fandom? Do if you're a Kiss fan, do you know 23rd and 8th that you know that that's the album cover in the way that you know Beatles are connected to Abbey Road? I mean, is that is it that kind of a connection? Can you and, and can you speak to that? Thanks. It is that type of connection. It's a very popular spot, especially when they played their last two shows in December. Uh, hundreds of fans went to that area. They didn't just go to the concert and enjoy the different experiences for the Kiss End of the Road concerts. They were going to the corner of 23rd and 8th. They were going near the lawn. So as far as the location, just getting a Kiss Street sign in the 23rd Street area honors both the loft and the street corner. But we have a unique situation where the street light post is part of the history. Whereas you can't really have an, any other example where you did a street light honor for any subject. And it, there's not really a connection with that street light post. This is actually a connection with the street light post. And you're gonna have so many people who already take their photo with it, wanna also have it that they take their photo and have the Kiss Corner name on it. So, and, and like I said, I call it Kiss Corner because you can go one direction to Fifth Avenue and visit the loft where they started. And if you go a different direction, you can go up to Madison Square Garden where they performed all these years. So that's why I felt 23rd Street and 8th Avenue is the better spot because it's an iconic mm. photo and it's it's more memorable as far as putting it there on the corner uh, compared to where the loft is. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have Alice and then we have Rodney. Hi, is the band aware of your petition? Yeah, that's my question. Okay. If you could hear the is the band aware of your petition? Yeah, they are. They posted about it. Wow. Ah, that's what? A, they posted about it is the answer, uh, which is that's why we maybe receive some of the public attention we're getting. Yeah, go ahead. So another question is, to me, what I mean, is why now? Um, recently, of course, the band you know, stopped touring. Um, I understand they're going into a new commercial venture. Um, why do you, you, you know the band and everything they've done, this seems to me a uh, 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 situation where the corner could be used for um, investing in their commercial, their new commercial ventures. What do you think about that? 
Well, the thing is with Kiss, they're immortal. They're forever. So although the band's not touring anymore, they want the characters and the music to go on for eternity for even more fans and a new generation of people to see them. So mm-hmm. there's great technology going on with artificial intelligence and to take different music artists like ABBA and do these uh, stage shows with holograms and avatars. So that's the future for Kiss. Is even though they're not touring, they want Kiss to continue on and keep having that great concert experience that they've already given uh, for 50 years. But also, like I said, it's good timing because you have the 50th anniversary coming up of the album cover. So that's going to be March 19th, 2025. That would be a great day if that could be the event. And the Kiss biopic as well. So Kiss will just still be in the intention uh, of people and the biopic is going to heavily promote the chelsea and 23rd street area which will just bring more interest and tourism to the neighborhood as well thanks michael i'm going to do one more question for the committee and then i'm going to turn to the public you know, turn. okay so we're going to uh we're going to pause the uh, committee questioning now we're going to open it to the members of the public uh seeing that there might be a number of people who are here to speak on this issue um, please raise your hand in the uh, uh, if you are if you are here to speak on this issue. Please raise your hand in the uh, attendees uh, column, and you will be moved, moved over uh, one or two at a time. Um, just for those who are new to our our uh, community board uh, meetings, uh, just a little bit of background. We are all volunteers here. We are not paid to be here. Um, and while it is typical for our evenings to go, uh, sometimes they have gone three, four, five, six hours. Our meetings. We try our best uh, to keep them up relatively, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, everything efficient in communication. So if I would ask if you're here to speak, uh, please, uh, for for uh, our behalf and for for anyone else who's here to speak on their behalf. Please keep your <laughs> remarks less than two minutes. Um, I would hate to start having to crack down and cut people off, but uh, uh, hopefully we don't get there. Hopefully we just have a lively discussion and hear from everyone. But excited to hear from from those. So um, again, put your put your keep your hand raised uh, if you're here to speak on this, and we'll move you over a couple at a time and, and let you speak for a couple. Point of information, Chester. Thank could you. they yeah. list where they? Or could they tell us where they're from? Like then. Sure, that's a great point. Or, before you speak, if you could just uh, let us know what your uh, uh, let us know where you're from, if you're from a particular area, or what your particular particular connection to this topic is. Uh, that would be a great way to introduce yourself. Uh, so with that, Janine, I'm going to let you run the show of, of who gets to speak, because I can't really see you. Sure, so Russell and Derek. All right, Russell, you're up. Uh, you're on mute, Russell. Okay. Hey, my name is Russell Daniker. I'm a lifelong New Yorker, born and raised in Staten Island, New York. I've been a KISS fan since I was six years old. My father took me to my first show in 1977. And I've made many KISS friends all over the world. And every time somebody comes to New York City, they contact me and say, hey, can you take us to the KISS sites in the city? The number one stop everywhere, every time is 23rd Street and 8th Avenue. It's uh, an iconic place for all KISS fans and from all people around the world. And also, like like the other gentleman said, the loft is not too far down the block on 23rd Street. There's also other places, the, the Palladium, where KISS is played in 1980. So there's other stops in that whole area. And not only that, KISS's charitable work, KISS has been very, very, very charitable through the years. Um, Wounded Warriors, they, they did a tour called Freedom to Rock Tour where they brought Wounded Warriors on stage and sang the national anthem with them and donated proceeds from the profits of the concert to the Wounded Warriors. So they've done Make-A-Wish where they bring kids backstage before and after the show to meet them, all charitable work. So if there was ever a question of a band that's deserving of a corner, never mind Wu-Tang Clan corner on Staten Island and everything else, Kiss has been around 50 plus years in Madison Square Garden, they just played, it looked like the United Nations from people all over the world, South America, Japan, Australia, everywhere. It was crazy. It was insane. And number two, I just want to say, Gene Simmons does know about this. The guy's in KISS. He didn't know about it, but he found out about it, so he knows. And I think they're very excited. And I hope this happens because I think it would be good for New York City. And I think it would be good for all the KISS fans that are deserving of this. Great. Thank you so much, Russell. Thank you for the testimony. Uh, uh, Derek, I think it was? Yeah. Hi there. Uh, my name is Derek Christopher. I'm actually in Los Angeles, but I just wanted to add something about the importance of that corner. I produced two huge KISS expos, one in LA and I did one in New York City. 
And one of the things we did in New York was we did a bus tour of KISS landmarks. We did it in LA also. But of course, New York is where KISS is from. And the, the biggest stop that people could not wait for was that corner where they shot Dress to Kill. So with KISS fans, it's an iconic place. It's an iconic corner. Um, Peter Chris was there with us, the original drummer. And everybody got out. They took photos. There were people there already taking photos. So I just sort of wanted to speak to that that, imp that corner is important for KISS fans. It's very iconic because it was on the album cover. And, uh, you know, I'm one of those guys that flew out to New York for the, the final two shows. I've been a lifelong KISS fan. And I think it would be a great honor for these guys. They do do a lot of work. They do a lot of charity work. And uh, it's good for New York City. I think anytime you guys can celebrate uh, an artist that that came out of the city, I, I think it's a great opportunity to do it. So that's all I wanted to add. Great. Thank you so much, Derek. Yeah. Uh, I see Adam and then I see my, sorry, Jimmy, I'll let you, I think it's Adam next. Hi. Um, I live at the uh, Chelsea Hotel. And uh, so I'm right by the, uh, the corner there. And... Uh, um, I don't want to, uh, dispute that some people love KISS, but I'm not sure that, uh, KISS Corner is the best idea. Um, there's, and I've got a few reasons for that. Um, one is I'm not sure that we want to be honoring a band who is most prominent, uh, been most prominently in the news over the last few decades for misogyny, sexual assault allegations, uh, and other uh, sordid and offensive acts and um, uh, and statements. Um, another is, I just think in general, maybe we don't want to uh, prematurely uh, honor people. Um, you know, as a former fan of Bill Cosby and O.J. Simpson, uh, mm -hmm. you never know what happens. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, I don't know what your regulations are, but um, uh, that's just something to bear in mind that you never know, uh, especially given the uh, very credible allegations against uh, Gene Simmons, um, which I'm sure other people will talk about uh, in greater detail. And finally, um, as a resident of the Chelsea Hotel, I think that there are so many other um, compelling artists, writers, um, musicians who we might want to honor in this neighborhood um, and in this particular part of the neighborhood who have much stronger connections. Um, Arthur Miller, Arthur C. Clarke, uh, Bob Dylan, Leonard Cohen, um, people who, uh, who lived here, worked here, created works of art here, um, that uh, somebody who just happened to have a photo shoot on the corner one day uh, seems to me um, that that's not really uh, that, that that's not honoring somebody who with the strong connection to the community that we want to have. Um, in okay. addition to um, in addition to the fact that I'm not sure that we want to be honoring these people who are not have not made great contributions um, to the uh, to the New York community or the world as a whole. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. And uh, to Mike, just so you know, you'll have a chance to, uh, before we move into committee discussion, you know, to respond. But it, I'm going to say, you know, if you if you have anything you want to say at the end, it'll be, if you want, you'll get to say your comments after you've heard, heard all the public statements first. Thank you so much, Adam. Uh, Mike, go ahead. Thank you for having me. Appreciate that. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, I just wanted to uh, say that the previous gentleman did make a good point about some of the other New York artists, but KISS has always been and will always really call New York City their home. Every time, and I'm, myself as a lifelong New York City resident, I have taken people from around the world to that location. If you ask any KISS fan anywhere on this planet to name one New York location that is most indicative of what KISS is, what they represent, where they're from, their hometown, it's that corner. It's because of that album cover. It's because the song that's on that album cover is one of the biggest selling songs in the history of music. So really, everything KISS has done points back to that moment. And in regards to what they have or have not done for the city, if we're looking at uh, that from a financial aspect, they have brought millions for over 50 years to that city with, with all of the, the, you know, the pop-up stores, the shows, everything they've done. Uh, they've done millions of photo shoots around the city, so it's not specific that this location is being chosen just because they were there. This is an iconic album cover for one of the most iconic bands in history, 
And really, I think they have given more to New York than people are giving them credit for. Uh, and a lot, some of the claims that have been made against them are made against every artist, every rock star. Uh, and all mm. of them have been unfounded with, with uh, Kiss, especially Gene Simmons. So I think it would be uh, a great mm. thing for the community because so much business comes in with people from around the world that would not generally visit that area. They may go to the garden for a concert. They may go to Central Park, you know, the typical locations. But right there is a hub for millions of fans. And I think it would be a great spot to celebrate that band and to bring further commerce to the area with people that may not come there otherwise. Thank you very much, Mike. Mike, do you mind just sharing um, where you're calling from or? Uh, the Bronx. I don't know. From where? The, the Bronx. Bronx. The Bronx, sorry. Great. No problem. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, Phyllis? with us? Yes, I'm here. Yeah. Um, while I appreciate Michael's enthusiasm for KISS, um, and my stepson is a big fan, I live on 23rd Street between 8th and 9th Avenues. And every time we've done a street naming, we've done it for a member of the community that has contributed greatly to the community, like Bob Trenton, <clears throat> Trentline or Irwin uh, Cohen, um, and they did a lot of work in the community. Uh, I have a big problem with naming that corner Kiss Corner. I also think it may be misconstrued in generations down the road uh, as to what the hell Kiss Corner is all about. I've never seen, I've lived here for 42 years. I've never seen any Kiss fans congregating by that light post. And I didn't even know about it till it became an agenda item for your committee. So um, I really don't think it's appropriate to name the corner Kiss Corner. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, fellas. Uh, Amber. Hi, good evening, uh, Jesse, Christine, and the members of the committee. Uh, my name is Amber Nicosia. Uh, I live in Penn South. I actually live on 24th Street and 8th Avenue. We are an affordable housing community, and uh, we represent about 5,000 residents, um, many of them <clears throat> who are musicians and artists who asked me to come here on behalf of them <clears throat> this evening. Um, I'm here tonight in support of the proposed co-naming of the corner of 23rd Street and 8th Avenue as the Kiss Corner. Uh, their 1975 Dress to Kill album uh, photograph yeah. uh, features Penn South in the background. And uh, Chelsea is historically a musical neighborhood. We have Tin Pan Alley, uh, which has recently been recognized. That's just a few blocks <clears throat> north from this location. Uh, the Kiss members were locals within the Chelsea community. The previous uh, president of Penn South actually used to be a taxi driver and used to work with uh, Ace Farley, who is uh, one of the band members. So these are people that not only worked in the community, uh, but they were musicians in the community and they spent time locally in the community. Many of our residents have stories about uh, the relationships with them uh, over the decades. I would be delighted to have this historically and musically significant addition made to the neighborhood. I hope that community board four votes in favor of the project. And when <clears> people <throat> construe what Kiss Corner is, I think it's also decades from now for people to have the delight of looking up and seeing that name on the corner of 23rd Street and 8th Avenue. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amber. Um, I see at least one other hand raised in uh, the attendees list. Again, if you're here to speak on uh, item 4A, the street code naming, uh, please raise your hand. I know we also have a couple members in, in uh, person here, uh, members of the public uh, who wish to speak, but I see uh, Brian and then <laughs> uh, 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 Brian, do you want to go first? Yep, go ahead, Brian. Um, okay. Um, sorry, I'm borrowing somebody else's computer here. So uh, if you don't see me or hear me, gesture. Um, <clears throat> so um, I actually um, was at the very first KISS concert, New Year's Eve, uh, 1973 Academy of Music, East 14th Street. 
um, leading off the bill uh, with Teenage Lust, Iggy Pop and the Stooges, and Blue Oyster Cult. Wow. Um, so there's some history there. Um, I've lived in Chelsea since 1979, except for a few years in the 80s when I was Brooklyn curious, um, but continuously since 89. <laughs> Um, some history there as well. I'm currently on the 200 block of West 25th Street, so around the corner. Um, I really enjoyed Michael's presentation, um, but I'm speaking in opposition to his proposal. Um, I think that uh, I'm, I'm actually saying some things that have been said. I mean, it's clear from the, the heavy Kiss fans here that's been said several times that this is an iconic location for KISS fans. Um, I have to say KISS is not an iconic uh, artist or band for Chelsea. Um, with all of that history, you know, the, for myself, I have never been aware that there was any special connection between KISS and Chelsea. Uh, again, I, although I don't question uh, that they've done lots of good things in lots of places, um, again, there is no... Uh, knowledge that I have of any deep involvement in the Chelsea community itself, um, as versus, for example, the people that Phyllis mentioned who've done a lot for the, directly for the community. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, 23rd Street and 8th Avenue is, uh, to belabor the term, kind of an iconic location for Chelsea. I mean, it's a major, major cross section. And I think that if there's going to be co-naming of that uh, intersection, it should be for somebody who is more closely identified with the community. As uh, one of the first speakers said, we have the Chelsea Hotel just up the block, which is just bursting with artistic and creative history that I think is more deeply identified with Chelsea and its creative roots. Um, so I think this is a very special location to Chelsea, uh, as apparently as it is to KISS fans. But from my perspective as a Chelsea resident, uh, I think there could be better uses than making this uh, KISS corner. I also think uh, there is the possibility that there may be people who may decide this is a place where people should go take pictures for Instagram of kissing each other. And maybe that's a lovely thing in its own way, but I think there's a lot of opportunity for this to be misconstrued. So um, I will just leave it at that and thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, Janine, do we have Lisa. anyone else? Yeah, Lisa. Okay. Lisa. Can you hear me? Hello, um, I'm, my name's Jason and Lisa is my fiance and we're in favor of Kiss Corner. Um, Lisa is a lifelong um, member of the Chelsea community. Uh, we live in Penn South and um, in definitely in favor of Kiss Corner um, as far as Kiss being an international rock band, it would, definitely bring a lot of positive energy to Chelsea. Um, I know that there's people in favor and against, but our position is definitely of all, you know, inter internet, they are an international band. I've been to several KISS concerts myself. I'm from Los Angeles. Everybody I know in LA, all my friends, we, you know, everybody knows who KISS is and, you know, they're, they're an iconic band and, you know, if Kiss Corner was at 23rd and 8th, it's not going to do anything but good for all of the businesses and communities. There would be no negative impact other than, you know, there would be no negative impact. It would be it would bring fans from all over the world to Chelsea, to that corner. And next year is the 25th anniversary. The, excuse me. It's the 50th anniversary of that, you know, of that album cover. And it would bring people from all over the world of all cultures to Chelsea. And that's what Chelsea is all about. So we're definitely thank 100%. You. Thank you for and kiss, for and an kiss is an iconic New York band. Iconic New York band. Okay. And that was a great presentation, Mike. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. Uh, Janine, do we have anyone else online? Yeah, I brought George over. Okay. Is George our last? Yes? Yeah. Okay. Hello, well, everybody. Oh, go ahead, George. I want to thank everybody for their time today. I'm coming here in support and favor of Kiss Corner. 
Uh, my first Kiss concert was the Rock the Nation tour, 2004. The first with the lineup with Tommy and Eric, and I actually attended and flew out to New York City for the last. Um, me being in the generation where Kiss has really held the torch for you know the future, and they're leaning towards the future with the avatars. I am looking for something where I can take my kids to in the future generations of what can Kiss have in the future that can actually embody the driving force, that triumphant force that they were moving forward. For example, uh, I'm on the West Coast. Like I said, I flew to, flew to New York for the last show. Uh, the band Van Halen, uh, who originated in Pasadena, we have many uh, Eddie Van Halen spots originated here where the fans love to come and visit. Now, I know in New York, I'm not, I'm not from the East Coast, so I'm not really familiar with all the street names and whatnot, but I did go to this corner and I saw many people who were attending the Madison Square Garden shows and said, this is a must come. And people actually directed me to where they were. They were very friendly in that in that sense. Um, now, this is going to greatly boost the uh, population for, for KISS fans who are going to come and all music fans. Now, we talked about what contributions have they done. We talked, uh, Paul Stanley was a cab driver. Now, I, I do want to say that KISS has always um, promoted the sense of the hardworking ethic is going to pay off to success. And I feel like New York as a city have always heard the American dream. Gene Simmons, uh, the bass player, came um, to America at the age of eight years old, barely speaking English, and he had uh, created this along Peter Chris, Paul Stanley, and Ace Frehley, obviously, um, to create this band that we know, know and love today. Now, I do want to say, just to kind of wrap everything up, um, I do want to, if this does happen, I would like to see the inclusion in some way, even if it's Kiss Corner, not to misconcept anything, maybe you can utilize the Kiss font that's been iconic, um, but I do want to say I would like to see the inclusion of potentially Ace Frehley, Peter Chris, and even Bruce Kulick to be at, at the event if we're going to have some kind of unveiling event or Kiss New York City takeover as well. Again, I'd like to thank you for your time. I'm in favor of Kiss Corner, and I really hope I can make a trip out to the East Coast and see it uh, take place. Thank you. Thanks very much, George. Um, we have a few members, a couple of members of the public uh, here. If you wish to speak, um, if, if you mind coming up to the front and speaking loudly so that our microphones up here can hear you. Oh, okay. oh, do you mind? So, it's just, thank you very much. All right. Floor is here, sir. I, I, I just wondered if it's okay for me to be here. <laughs> no, it's all right. Fine. Um, yeah, my name is Gerald Donnelly. I'm not a Chelsea resident. I worked at 53, went to the clerk for 20 years. My father worked there for 30. Okay, I've been a KISS fan all my life. And uh, I started playing music with a lot of my friends too. And it was an inspirational thing to play an instrument instead of getting into the stuff young people can get into. Uh, I don't know if uh, anyone's aware, really, but uh, Paul Stanley was born with no uh, ear over here. And that's, mm -hmm. and for a guy that made it music, you know, that's uh, commendable, I think. He overcame a lot of adversity. And today, he has an organization for uh, children born with uh, facial deformities. And uh, that wasn't mentioned. I wanted to mention that. And I'm here to find out how I can help. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you for the for the information. Appreciate that you're here, uh, sir. And the uh, the other are we here to speak on this? Do you want to speak on this? No, go kiss. Okay, just the <laughs> general go kiss sentiment being shared in the room. Michael, um, I'm going to give you just a couple minutes just to respond uh, to anything you heard um, uh, before we move it into committee discussion here. Uh, so go ahead and um, uh, feel free to the floor is yours. I think an important thing to keep in mind is honoring New York's music history. Why do we have it that we have all these hip hop artists who some of them have some questionable lyrics in their music? You know, let's say Notorious well, B.I.G. Michael, Michael, one second, we just lost sound in the room. Uh, I think someone kicked a wire. And, uh, so give us one second. Sorry. Uh, get, Michael, do you want to just give us a little fast sound for us? Mind <laughs> speaking, let's see if we can hear you. Can you hear me? Testing? No, it's not ready yet. Okay. All right, hold on. We got, yeah. we got to give it a second if we don't. Do a This is Swedish. <laughs> Charlie, usually such a 
positive contributor to this committee, and yeah, it's going on now. <laughs> you know, you're the person who went to fix it, so you can play. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry, we're still waiting for the boot up in the room. It's there. There it is. All right, I'm talking now. Michael, can Michael, you hear me? Can you hear us? Hello? Yeah. yeah. Right. Testing? Sorry, Michael. Sorry about that. I mean, when it comes to Chelsea's music history, there's two main things I think of uh, Sid and Nancy with the Chelsea Hotel and Kiss. And when we have it that the hip hop community is well represented throughout the city with all these different artists. There's all these DJs and Notorious B.I.G., Wu-Tang Clan, and even other musical artists like Tony Bennett is going to be honored. That to not honor New York's biggest band and the rock history for New York would be a disservice to New York City and for what the band has done. I agree as far as the street naming, if we could try to do the KISS logo, or if we can't have that, to have it in capitalization so there could be a difference. Uh, but also the points about how Kiss is not one of those bands where after they retired touring that they're just looking to, you know, close it up and end their career. They want Kiss to go on forever. They're going to be avatars. They could be cartoon characters. Generations of people will know about Kiss. So anyone seeing the sign will still know, oh, that's Kiss. Those are the guys with the makeup. It's not something that's going to go away, especially when you have a 50-year legacy like Kiss, where there's not too many rock bands that have such a long le legacy. You know, maybe the Rolling Stones, you could say. But there's not that many other bands that you could say, you know, we're going on, you know, for 50 years. And there's been other artists that have been honored where they may have some questionable lyrics, some of the hip hop choices or questionable past, but they were still honored based on their inspiration and their uh, contributions to music and the arts and with New York. Another point I want to make is a lot of times with street signs, it's to honor someone who passed away as well. And when it comes to Kiss, they had a member named Eric Carr who was the second drummer and he was a New Yorker. He went to school in Manhattan and sadly he passed away. So they would also be honoring uh, Eric Carr as far as someone who passed away, you know, as a member of the group. And as far as the connotations, when it comes to the name, is it a big thing if you have it that by New Year's, if anyone, you know, can't be in Times Square that they have a mistletoe, a kiss corner and they do a kiss or they get engaged or whatever and have a celebration. I don't think that's such a bad thing. So I think it serves many purposes and New York should honor its music history along with all the other things that New York honors with street signs. Great. Thank you so much, Michael. Uh, uh, thank you again for the presentation. Uh, thank you for everyone who's come to speak uh, either uh, in support or, or against. Um, it was very interesting to hear from everyone. I actually, I learned a lot about KISS. Um, we're gonna move to uh, discuss this as a committee now. Um, I have several thoughts myself, but I will reserve them for the end uh, until I can hear what other people have to say. Um, and also, again, just to keep in back in mind, and, and feel free to, if you, you know, uh, uh, if, if you think your position might uh, uh, be affected by change in the guidelines, you know, it's, it's, it's worth just sharing that maybe now and just so that we can get that conversation uh, going a little bit. Um, but um, I just want to be curious to hear what people, people think. Uh, Brett, I want to be first, but um, yeah, I, I, I'm Andrew's neighbor, so I'm in the same building. And sometimes I think, how can we get more tourists in our neighborhood? Because we just don't have enough people here. Um, <laughs> that, sorry, that was uh, a. <laughs> um, no, um, I so so Mike, I just want to I want to say if I need a publicist, I'm definitely going to come looking for you. You did a fantastic job selling something <laughs> that in the agenda I was at first like, what the heck? But. Um, so you know we we do have some we do have as Christine was saying a very high bar when it comes to of, of street naming. Um, usually it is very much about contrib contributing to the neighborhood. Someone who's very associated with that block, somebody who might have <clears throat> done something to help advance that like the community, the block. I think um, it, it is a very high bar, um, and there are alternatives to street names. For example, uh, not many people. Are, are always aware to look up, but like on 34th Street by the New Yorker, there's a flight um, for Linda Tesla, where he uh, had died um, in that hotel. So, you know, maybe the vitamin shop would be willing to put up a plaque commemorating the, uh, you know, that corner as well. So, or or the building you know, of the loft where they were, there, there are other alternatives to a street naming um, to, to commemorate an event or, a, or, you know, lose rock and roll <clears throat> things and things like that, maybe the Madison Square Garden. 
Um, so I want I want to hear what other people think because I can I you know perhaps be persuaded, but um, I think when we, we are looking at street namings, it's it's got it usually is something that makes me think this neighborhood really is about this location is really about the person or the whatever we're naming for. Um, and I'm, and I don't you know I've only lived in the neighborhood for like twenty five years, so not you know but I've never really associated our neighborhood with this yes. Um, yeah. um, I, will, I will certainly agree with what's been said here about the community aspect of it. Uh, as much as they've done some very good things throughout the world, various organizations, uh, what personally for me and I think members uh, in our community is what's the tie in? What, what have you done for us lately in terms of enhancing our quality of life? Um, but to have you maybe put up on a, on a ramp. <clears throat> All due respect um, to what they've done musically and what they've done commercially, especially, um, and what they brought together in terms of a fan base that is uh, dedicated to them. Um, uh, um, in terms of what as they've done for the uh, community itself, um, it doesn't seem to be much happening on that end. Um, and I think at this point will become a commercial aspect. Uh, for the group uh, going forward um, as they uh, transition into another state of, um, of musicality, so to speak. So <clears throat> I, I would not be going to this um, as a name. Thank you. Uh, Baron? Yes, very quickly. I'm just going to agree with both of you. I think uh, you know, Alan, uh, I forget his name, he brought up this year for Chelsea Hotel itself as a cultural icon in more ways than one. And if you really think about folks coming in and out of that hotel itself, would require to keep names along the sidewalk. So I think going back to this uh, contribution to the community life and cultural life of Chelsea itself, KISS is a remarkable group and great musically speaking. Uh, they can have a whole fan base and you just could listen to them and whatnot. But there's no convincing sort of argument to be made by the naming of the corner where the photograph was taken for a particular album is very compelling, at least not in my book. I mean, New York City is a very popular spot on the planet. A lot of musicians come and go and get in different places. And they become remarkable people too, more often than not. But again, if we start naming street corners and streets with every significant person that visits New York, this city will be not a city without not a city of streets without me, but there will be many more streets and we should be named in that manner. So I'm kind of leaning away from naming this particular corner for kids. Okay. Uh Charlie? Uh, I'd like to, to echo what Darren said. Um, I, first of all, I'd like to say I thought Michael gave a great presentation. Um, I'm a big rock and roll fan. I'm not specifically a KISS fan, but uh, I, I really appreciate the enthusiasm from all of the members of the KISS Army that turned out uh, both virtually and in person here to support this. And I think that's um, it's, it's great to see. Um, but I, I do agree with the sentiments shared by the other committee members about the high bar. Um, I think the fact that um, I, while appreciating the connection to 23rd Street and Fifth Avenue and where they have the um, <clears throat> the lot there, I think this particular connection, I, I lived in Chelsea uh, for 10 years on 8th Avenue in the 20s, and despite being a pretty big rock and roll fan, I was not aware of this light post. Um, I think if you look at the album cover, if there's some sort of collage or photoshopping, you can't really see anything other than the light post and a car and sort of blacked out. It just, unlike... The, the Beastie Boys reference where it's you know showing that um, exact uh, street corner. The other thing that I would say to Beard's point is um, it, we live in an iconic city with a lot of iconic street corners and there's a whole lot of uh, bands in the world. Uh, to give an example, Sting has an album called 57th and 9th. Uh, 57th Street, 9th Avenue is in our district. Um, but I don't think, um, you know, I, I think if we, you, you could look at a lot of street corners in New York that have connections to rock and roll. Um, if we're going to get down to just a, a photograph or an album cover, I think it needs to be something a little more significant uh, connected to the band. Like this is the where they had their first concert or, or something like that. But and again, I think the overall point of the band not having a deep connection to the community board for district is uh, is what really sways me to a post. Christine. Yeah. Um... 
Well, same as what everybody said, first of all, the presentation was great and the um, excitement is great. I'm a big, super, big fan of the rock and roll too. So, um, but we have guidelines and the guidelines say that we need compelling evidence that, you know, the application feels all of the following, right? So the first one is the person must have had a long-standing presence and association with the community, with the vicinity. And I don't, I don't see it. Uh, the person or entity must have an extraordinary record of public service to the community, to CB4. And um, I don't see it. And then there must be strong local support and virtually no opposition from residents and businesses. And we saw that there was opposition, at least from a block association, which is a, a, a fairly a significant <clears throat> group. So I, I think that, you know, this is a great idea. It doesn't fit the mold, right? It doesn't fit the guidelines we have been given by the board. And, uh, you know, plaques on, on wall or plaques on uh, Fifth Avenue, uh, all of those things will play the role of saying this is where something important happened, but the the, the, the secondary sign is is not fitting. You know, it it doesn't fit the, the guidelines we have, and therefore, I think even if this community uh, committee was saying, okay, we just want, let's throw out the guideline and we like it, I think the board, the the full board, would not. Mm -hmm agree to it. So uh, I think that, I, and I don't want to hide behind that. I mean, I, I don't think, peer, you know, I just absolutely don't think it fits the guideline, but, you know, and then the new guidelines from the city are requiring, will be requiring that the person be dead, you know, be deceased before people concern it. So it's it's not going in the right direction, but you know the band. The band is great. People are coming to that place. It should be marked in all the the guides, right? Uh, it should be on Google. It should be on Google Map. You can do as many uh, secondary sign you want in Google Map, and uh, uh, that's the way it is. But I, I don't think it, it fits the bill. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, hats off for taking the initiative and for driving this process and, and gathering so much energy around this is very good um all right i'll uh, i'll say a few thoughts as well thank you everyone for uh, contributing um and uh, so it's just a, of course to echo what i said <clears throat> michael fantastic presentation um uh really uh, uh a lot of good information and you know i can see that you were trying to tie this to the guidelines that we set out um, and tie your application to the guidelines to try to to try to meet them um, um, where you could. Um, you know, I, one thing that sort of struck me uh, was, you know, I think a lot of people may tie, uh, uh, you know, RuPaul with uh, uh, making it mainstream for men to wear makeup, but really, uh, you know, Kiss has been out <laughs> out ahead of that for a long time, and you know, perhaps, uh, uh, you know. It, uh, uh, Kiss uh, over there are many decades of, uh, of performing where the makeup could really um, uh, uh, go toe to toe with uh, with uh, you know the amount of makeup worn in our district from from the drag queens in Chelsea and Hell's Kitchen and I think I think I think we have to respect that part of their art and and their contributions to uh, uh, pushing uh, uh, boundaries of what is expected of us and what is normal. Um, you know, I know there are, I just wanted to, you know, go in and look, and, and Gene Simmons is himself on record, you know, supporting the LGBT community specifically in relation to, to them knowing that they sort of stretch the bounds of, of uh, what is normal. And, you know, he's quoted as saying, I totally support anybody who wants to be unique. And I think that's something that we can, we can celebrate. That being said, uh, as, as has been, you know, echoed, <clears throat> as has been laid out here, you know, as we typically uh, vote to uh, on on street co namings. They have been typically uh, individuals who are are deceased who have long standing history in the community. Most recently, we voted to do a street co naming for a street cross crossing guard who was tragically killed 
um, um, save, trying to save other other lives, and uh, the whole community came out to rally in support of that of the street co naming, and and usually that's sort of the standard by which which we go for um, and what we think about when we're thinking about street co namings, and so the bar is very very high uh, typically. Um, that said, uh, and so I think for that reason, I think for the guidelines and what what we've been through in terms of that that long connection, you know, I think. Ultimately, my vote is also no. Although I, they do have more of a connection to Chelsea than I realize, and I think that you know we've heard other applicants who really have absolutely no connection to the community, and, and I don't think we can say that here. And I do think we need to take that into account when we vote. But ultimately, I just don't know if they meet our threshold. And the final thing I will say is just simply, um, perhaps it is something that we would want to explore going forward, though, in terms of amending our guidelines for the occasional instance where. There is a particular location that is so culturally significant, uh, uh, and you know, uh, or or perhaps could drive you know have economic benefit to our community in some particularly heavy way where we may want to consider it. But right now, as the guidelines are written, those are not uh, criteria that we are considering, and so um, unfortunately, at least uh, on my end, I I think I'm a no right now. Um, does anyone else have anything else? All right, so I think uh, I, I make the motion. A motion. Uh, there's a motion to deny. Mm -hmm. All right, is there a second for motion to deny? Second. second. All, right. All those in favor of a motion to deny? Mm -hmm. Anyone opposed? Present not eligible. Abstaining. Michael, to everyone who, oh, you abstain. We have one abstention uh, from Alice. Thank you, Alice. Um, uh, uh, Michael, thank you so much for all the oh. fans. Thank you so much for coming out. Um, in support, uh, um, and uh, good luck to you going forward. And please work with our office if, we, if, if it comes to helping trying to find a place for a plaque or somewhere else that we can, you know, some other uh, um, uh, significant marker of what that corner and what that block means to kids, uh, we are happy to help you with that. Um, but it just seems right now, at least for our committee standpoint, uh, the street co naming is not going to be moving forward. Just one, one other suggestion. I mean, given that they're coming up, you see them coming up the stairs from the, from the stairway. I mean, guys, reach out to MTA. Maybe they can <laughs> put, put something on that stair mm -hmm. to mark mm -hmm. that location. That would be pretty yeah, interesting. Yeah, no way. Sorry, Michael. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, excellent presentation, as we said. Uh, good luck to you. Thank you. Forward. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. So uh, from our committee, but you know, you can always attend the full board meeting. There's another uh, where we have to go through a full, uh, a larger board than us. Um, and then from there, there's also city council. I will say, just so everyone here knows, by the way, that Beastie Boys uh, Square or block or whatever it is, uh, it was originally voted down by its community board and they they appealed it to their city council person and that's how it ended up getting, going through. But um, uh, so hope is certainly not lost. Uh, we are okay. just the beginning of a process. Well, so. thank you everybody. Yeah. I wore out two of those shirts in my lifetime. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, and now, uh, moving on to street coding application for 37th Street and 10th Avenue with orchestra. in honor of the orchestra, St. Luke's uh, 50th anniversary and the Barishkoff Arts 20th anniversary. Uh, uh, James, Amanda, Johnny, thank you so much. You've been so patient this evening. Uh, uh, Realize you've had your cameras on this whole time. You've been you've been patient, ready to go. Um, and so uh, let me stop talking so that you can finally uh, finally get into it. Thank you for being here, and uh, the floor is yours. Great, and thank you to the committee. And I think all of us are really impressed by you as volunteer leaders for our community and what you're doing and the seriousness with which you're taking all these issues. So it is a real pleasure. I'm going to share my screen here uh, to talk about these two. Uh, neighborhood nonprofits that I really are dedicated to the community and to making a difference for the lives here in Hell's Kitchen. So we are two nonprofits, uh, the Orchestra of St. Luke's and the Bershnikov Art Center. Uh, I'm the president and executive director of the Orchestra of St. Luke's. I'm here with, um, with our associate director of development, Amanda Lee, and then from the Bershnikov Art Center, uh, Chani Sabesco who is a development um, a manager of development, right? So our two organizations are form a unique partnership. 
in that we own a building together at 30, um, 37th and 10th, 450 West 37th Street. Uh, we moved here at different times and we'll go into the timing of that um, coming up, but what we have coming up next year is a co-anniversary, 50 years for the Orchestra of St. Luke's and 20 years for Brishnikov Arts. So Brishnikov Arts was founded by the iconic dancer, Mikhail Brishnikov. And I have to say, when I started working here uh, nine years ago, I thought I would get used to seeing Misha, Misha in the hallways every day at work. I have to admit, I have not gotten used to it. It's still a thrill every time. So uh, founded in 2005, uh, by Misha, the Brishnikov Art Center support artists in the pursuit of their talent in ways that they couldn't do under the pressure of certain commercial um, 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 requirements. And so artists come through, they produce work, and sometimes they perform it, sometimes they just workshop and create things that will go out and have new lives elsewhere. They commission new works and they provide rental space as well um, for you know over 2,000 artists um, comprising a hundred organizations. The or Orchestra of St. Luke's, um, we have an unusual name uh, and we are very aware of that. The Orchestra of St. Luke's is the second largest orchestra in the city after the New York Philharmonic. We have a $10 million budget, $43 million of net assets. Uh, we were founded in 1974 at the Church of St. Luke in the Fields and that's where we got our name. Uh, we were itinerant, um, an itinerant orchestra for many years, but after Misha built the, um, uh, the center here, we came shortly afterwards to take, out, take part of the building on, and we own the building together, the two organizations. Uh, the New York Times calls us New York's hometown band, uh, which we really love, and we have a three-part mission, which is performance, which we do all over the city, um, education, which we do a lot of it right here in Hell's Kitchen, and, uh, and the Domena Center for Classical Music, which is the name of our part of the building at 450 West 37th Street. Uh, one of the things that we're very proud of is we're the only orchestra in New York to own its own building and the only orchestra in New York to have its own um, uh, youth orchestra. And you, when you see children walking up and down the street in Hell's Kitchen with violins and violas and cellos and basses, they're very probably part of the Youth Orchestra of St. Luke's, which is right here in Hell's Kitchen at the Domena Center. Uh, the work that happens here at the Domena Center really involves the creation of art to be performed here and elsewhere. So we provide rental spaces for rehearsals, rental spaces for recordings and broadcasts and education, about 500 ensembles, this is uh, actually misprint, about uh, 500 ensembles per, um, comprising 30,000 musicians work here uh, each year. So a little bit of the history, and again, it happens in, in several stages. So um, Brishnikov Arts breaks ground at 450 West 37th Street in 2001. Um, the 9-11 uh, attacks sort of put a pause on things, but um, the, uh, the company eventually opens. And um, in 2005 and 2008, they purchased another part of the building that was owned by another company. And in 2011, Orchestra of St. Luke's purchases the best, to, the rest of the building to create the Domena Center for Classical Music. During the uh, pandemic, the um, we like to say that the 450 West 37th Street became something of a Noah's Ark for artists who came here to produce work and to stream it live out to the rest of the world uh, from our perch here in Hell's Kitchen when concert halls were closed around the world. Uh, Kate Levin was a big supporter of uh, our work as was Michael Bloomberg. Uh, Michael Bloomberg gave um, through the, um, sorry, the, the city under Michael Bloomberg gave the largest gift for the building of uh, uh, the Domena Center, which was eight and a half million dollars. So the spaces uh, within the building, so we're six floors, about 50,000 square feet, and uh, divided between the two halves, OSL, which has the um, Domena Center, uh, has these uh, four main rooms, and here are some of the, the pictures of them. Uh, Mary Flagler, Mary Hall, last night, we had a free community concert there featuring young artists in our mentorship program. Uh, the Benzican Hall. Uh, uh, also, uh, Carrie Hall was featured in the, uh, the film Maestro. I don't know if any of you saw that film. Um, Benzican Hall is a little smaller. 
Uh, here's other views of various rooms um, that exist. The, um, uh, the Bershenkoff Art Center has these wonderful views, um, which actually I have from my window, which is right behind me. There you go. Um, as well as theaters, um, we have a wonderful uh, broadcast studio here. The live music for the Tonys uh, actually happens here at 450 West 37th Street and then is broadcast out to Radio City and then the rest of the world through our control room. And then just some, some of the um, statistics about the impact of the building. Uh, the two organizations together have about 300 to 350 uh, uh, employees who come here to work um, you know, throughout the year. But beyond that, the artists and, and renters who use the space really expand the impact. So 30,000 musicians served annually, 500 ensembles, $40,000 of rental space, um, over 200 recordings. And actually we have to say our recordings that have been made here um, by various um, groups have won the Oscar, the Emmy, the Grammy, the Tony, and the Golden Globe. Um, uh, also world premieres, educational programs and visitors. At the Brzezhnikov Art Center, we have 200 plus artists, musicians, and dancers um, who come together. Um, over 2,000 artists and organizations served through rentals, uh, 10,000 hours of space rented, um, and so many of that is sub so many of those hours are subsidized plus a performance calendar for about 30 live performances a year, a year, which are always mentioned in the New York Times. Just to give you an idea of the really the range of work that's produced here at 450 West 37th Street, um, and really speaking to the impact of the artists who gather together here and then create work that goes out to the rest of the world. Um, uh, the Joker soundtrack was recorded here at um, 450 West 37th Street. Uh, Maestro was filmed here. 60 Minutes has filmed here. ABT has rehearsed the New York Philharmonic Broadway shows. Um, the New York Youth Symphony down in the lower right-hand corner um, not only recorded their Grammy-winning um, album, but they um, had a wonderful celebration downstairs in Kelly Carey Hall when they, when they won. That had quite a viral um, appearance on YouTube. And very much co connected to the community here. I think that um, Brishnikov Art Center was conceived here in Hell's Kitchen. And when the Orchestra of St. Luke's, I mentioned that we were itinerant at one time, meaning that we played all over and didn't have our own home. When we moved here, we had neighbors for the first time. And so we thought, what, do what would our neighbors need that we could potentially provide? So we did a study and found that there was a dearth of after-school arts education programs. And we founded the Youth Orchestra of St. Luke's at the Police Athletic League 11 years ago with 12 students uh, playing violin and cello. Um, 10 years later, we've now grown to over tenfold and our students are matriculating to Juilliard. Some are playing at the New York Philharmonic Gala this year with Gustavo Dudamel. We also have a number of programs that are free or low cost, like Visionary Sounds, our mentorship program, our Composition Institute. The Brishnikov also has performances. The, the um, ticket prices are very affordable, I think $25 or $30. And we also have residencies and showings. And so we feel like with these two anniversaries that just happened to coincide, our 50th with the orchestra and the 20th with the Brishnikov Arts Center, uh, with our commitment to this community, our deep roots in this community, we, we thought that it would be a wonderful way to celebrate all of that. The community that we've come to be a part of, um, our connection to it, um, you know, through this co-naming of the street. And, uh, and we have, um, we've gathered 51 signatures um, in just a couple of weeks actually from businesses um, all around the city. We have letters of support mm -hmm. from the COO of the Hudson Yards and also from our community board number four. So we really, we really hope that you'll help us celebrate our residency here in Hell's Kitchen, our commitment to the community and also these two really exciting anniversaries. Thank you so much, Joe. Uh, thank you for the, for the presentation. Um, do you mind if we turn over to the community for questions? Please do, unless Amanda or Chani, did I leave anything out? 
Yeah, that's all I just wanted to know. Okay. All good. Uh, uh, David. I think it's great what you're doing. I live uh, maybe three blocks from you, and I've never, I've seen you uh, filming, obviously, but I've never felt any connection, to be honest with you. I've never, I didn't know anything about the you know, low cost community events, and it, you, you, I, it, it's not out there. For some reason, <clears> because I live in the neighborhood, and I'm very active. So, I mean, I think you need to somehow publish it more, get more, because I would love to go to some of your concerts. The other thing is, I also serve on the ACE um, ACES committee, which deals with arts and education, especially in the schools. So, I would like you, maybe, if you can, what local schools do you work with? I mean, you might work with a school in Bronx, that's nice, but do you work in Chelsea or Hell's Kitchen with any students? If not, or if so, could you expand that so that you can work with more Chelsea and HK students? Because that would and maybe set up something without ACES, which is another committee down the road. Great, so our youth orchestra, the Youth or Orchestra of St. Luke's is in five sites in Hell's Kitchen. Uh, the Domena Center being one of them. The after school sites are the Police Athletic League of Hell's Kitchen, um, PS 51, PS 111, and Midtown West are the schools. Not only do we go provide free instrument instruction, we give the students free instruments which they can take home and keep with them as long as they're with um, the youth orchestra. And, um, and we take our own musicians and we go and we perform in the schools as well. So you see the students walking back and forth from the Domena Center to their schools. And uh, I, I bet you'll notice now when you see a young person walking with a violin uh, on yes. the screen, and you'll know that they're probably headed to us. I'm, 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 I, I'm really um, very struck by your, your comment that you didn't know about our programs. Um, we always are trying to find a way to, um, to let more people know about the things that we do here that are free or low cost. And maybe we can talk to the committee about ways to get the word out in a, in a more efficient way. Well, I, I hear they're trying to get a street code name. <laughs> <laughs> uh, go ahead. Uh, so like David, um, I probably live nine blocks away and was not familiar with all your outreach. My question is also regarding the youth. Do you have direct outreach with like NYCHA housing or how does your outreach, is it they, they come to the power to uh, the buildings or do you guys go out to the neighborhoods? Do you have a program with NYCHA housing with uh, the youth? And what's the age for the youth? Is it 16 to 24 or younger? So uh, many, many answers to the question. So um, the youth orchestra itself is just part of what we do, and that's for middle school primarily, though we've had people who've stayed longer and longer. But we're hoping what we're hoping to do with the youth orchestra is to uh, um, be a sort of a pipeline for students from this neighborhood to go into other programs like the New York Youth Symphony, um, like interschool orchestras of New York, Juilliard um, Music Advancement Program. We're starting after it's 10 years to now see those things happening. Uh, the, the primary work of both organizations is a little bit backstage, if you will. So a lot of rehearsals happen here, a lot of recordings happen here, a lot of workshops happen here. So we're kind of an incubator and not all of that work that happens, that's the majority of what we do, not all of that work um, is for public consumption. That work is actually this is an incubator, if you will, a workshop for things to be done. So the tens of thousands of artists who come to, um, to work here each year, then we go to the local businesses, the restaurants, they'll become patrons of the neighborhood. And so, but the fact that some of the work that we do doesn't have a public facing aspect is, is, part of the, uh, is, is part of our mission. The things that do have a public facing mission um, you know, like last night, we had a free community concert. There were 400 people signed up to come uh, completely free. Um, we have a series of concerts that are sort of $25. And, you know, we try to get the word out. And we obviously need to do um, a more efficient job of reaching out to the neighborhood. But again, it's mixed in answer to your question. A good part of what we do is this workshop incubator type of work. Can you sign up on your website for a newsletter or some sort of outreach? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We're, we're all here about getting, you know, getting the word out regardless. And getting free. Yeah. 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 
It's no, that's fantastic. Other questions from the committee? I'm just curious about how much uh, space is set aside for for free. Let's say there's a group that wants to, doesn't have a place to to perform or uh, practice. Uh, do you have space set aside for, for those? Uh, yeah, so uh, it, it, we we do. The Brishnikov Arts Center provides space for artists to work for free, and not only that, but to be mentored by the staff and by Misha himself. It's one of the most generous parts of what happens in this building, and so that is that is always a part of it. Is it out there? And so the, the yeah, so there's. Being... There, there's an application process for that. And, and Chani, I don't know if you want to chime in a little bit about how that works. Sure. Um, so you can go on our website and fill out a form in order to receive space that is either free, subsidized, or for corporate partners, they do you know pay. Um, and so all that is reviewed here by our staff, and then we <clears throat> reach out personally. Um, and then once you are approved for your space, um, our production team works with you uh, throughout the duration of time that you are here. Um, we're extremely accommodating. I've never seen anything like it. I've only been here a short time. Um, but we, you know, house over 2,000 artists and organizations um, each year um, for as low as, you know, zero to, you know, $10, um, which is subsidized. And just to clarify, is that, is that both rehearsal space and performance space? Uh, that you're that you're sharing with individuals? Yes. So um, our studios are also performance spaces. Um, they're used for many things, mm -hmm. um, from dance rehearsals to music um, performances. We have a full um, operating theater um, that is 200 plus seats as well, where our season um, takes place. Um, and then on top of that, we also offer um, for any sort of corporate partner, they'll do interviews here and thing and film and all those things. But they are all spaces are available. Yep, that, thank you for that, Jim. Um, yeah. All these spaces are available to be rented. Ah, okay. Uh, uh, anyway, Pete had a follow-up. Out of curiosity, uh, during <clears throat> the pandemic, how do you how did you function? And uh, did you uh, set space aside for uh, the public or the individuals uh, that need food or they needed services. So during the pandemic, uh, we closed the building down during the first months um, that obviously that happened everywhere. And then uh, we felt the thing that we could really offer was the ability for artists to come and uh, reach an audience through electronic means. So we did, uh, as soon as it was allowed by the state, which I think was July of 2020, we bought cameras and started making the space available for audiences to stream. So we, we really felt that that was the, the place where we could make our biggest impact. <clears throat> and oh, I will also that. say that we, we paid our musicians and our artists throughout the pandemic. And so we many organizations uh, you know, put artists on furlough. We didn't um, during the whole time we paid our, our musicians. Well, thank you. Yeah, just a quick question. You, you want to put both names in, in the show name? Yeah, what's oh, the name? Good question. Good question. <laughs> well, two, yeah, so, so we almost didn't apply when we thought that there was a, a character limit. <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, Misha's name is quite long. And both organizations, you know, we're a unique partnership. And so we anticipate putting both names up there. Misha was here first, so we thought we'd start with Brishnikov Arts. Even though we're an older organization, we've been here just um, since 2011. But along, alongside, alongside. Maybe we can make the letters small, or we even wondered if you could do a corner. I mean, these are the things that we've been talking about internally. Mm -hmm. Or you could just have it now. Um... Yeah, remove the arts altogether. The suggestion that I would make is I don't know if you've ever involved um, high school STEAM program. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Similar to STEM, you have STEAM, right? Uh, educational program which has A for arts in it. I don't <laughs> know if you've ever known that there's actually one STEAM school in the house kitchen which you may be aware of. Uh, so, do you have any sort of relationship with that? With which, with which school? 
15 program schools do exist in New York City, and there's one in-house kitchen as well. Do you have any particular relationship? It doesn't make any sense. Steve, Steve, explain. Steve, yeah. stands for science, technology, uh, and engineering, and arts, and mathematics. And so, so we're with the we're with the schools I mentioned, um, and but with our own. We're, we're collecting data on academic outcomes and really tracking longitudinally how the work with the youth orchestra affects their academic outcome. So I, it's because we're an after school program, in a sense, you know, it's for the school itself to integrate um, that, those learnings into the, into the schools. Um, but we'd be happy to know about this additional school. So, which is why which is why I'm mentioning Steam because they do have after school programs pretty much. So, is Steam the name of the school? S no no S T E A M is the program. It's, it's an acronym. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Do you know the name of the school? But do you know which school? Yeah. And yeah. They're funny. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Christine. Yes. So I live right next to you on <laughs> 38, and I come to your theater very often, and it's a wonderful resource. Thank you. Um, and I have a bunch of questions. <laughs> when you're, uh, you're, you showed a list of your, you know, uh, 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 pro bono kind of activities. Could you put that up again? And yes. Because I wanted to, each of them have a sense of how many people you serve, about those people, how many people live in CV4. Because right. one of the criteria, as you have heard, right, this, this list, how many people do you serve through these options and, and how many of them are in the neighborhood? Sure, and I'm gonna, um, some of this we know Exactly. For instance, the Youth Orchestra of St. Luke's, this is um, a Hell's Kitchen based local program, um, about 120 to 150 students and their families, uh, because we really try to create a community, not only of students who are learning their instruments, but we're trying to make a community of the families who know each other, who know the orchestra, um, who interact with the orchestra. They come to our concerts at Carnegie Hall. We have a pizza party before and I'll walk over from yeah, yeah, here. Yeah, I got you made the numbers. I'm yeah. sorry. Oh, the numbers. So so it's uh, about 120 to 150 okay. students plus their yeah. parents and brothers. What and about Visionary Sounds? Visionary Sounds is a series of um, of concerts that we do here. It's, it's open to the public. So some are local people, some are from outside, but um, this is a three concert series um, reaching 600 people in total a year. Um, the Chamber Music Mentorship Program is the one that happened last night. This has multiple um, activities within uh, the district. So the, the mentorship students go and they play in the public schools. Um, so there's, uh, we're connected with two schools, the Manhattan School of Music, and Menas College of Music, their students will go to the schools where the OSL is and play there. And we also are, have Those schools are in Hell's Kitchen? Or PS, in, uh, uh, PS 51, Midtown West, and PS 111. And also okay. the Athletic League in Hell's yeah. Kitchen. Um, okay. So this is uh, how many kids are there? In the... In the mentorship program, this is going to be about 20 participants, but they're going to be reaching hundreds of students um, in the right. area we're playing in the schools. Um, but 20 students, how many times a year? Uh, they'll go, no, the, the 20 students participate in the program, but then they will go out to the schools where they reach hundreds when they go to each schools. And so they'll, they'll do, during the course of the program, each of the 20 um, participants are in probably four or five ensembles. So each of those go out one time to one of the area schools. So we're talking, I mean, <clears throat> we can probably get you um, even better numbers if I'm not doing yeah, this. Good. Okay. Yeah. And so likewise, um, uh, Di Gaetano, uh, the arts performances, residents and showings, these are all things that um, are in facilities that are open to say, 200 people, audience members of capacity, and you know, 30 a year for the performances at Brishnikov, um, the residents and, and showing. I don't know, Chani, if you have any audience data that you can share like that. I think, I think you see where I'm going. I'm trying to yeah. establish yeah. 
the item number one here in our rules, which is that you have, uh, you know, doing record, extraordinary record of public service to the community, right? And and we don't have a good, you know, sense of that. Yeah. I mean, I know you're not doing it, but but you know, how much is it? And 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 it, is it for the whole city or is it for the neighborhood? And people would want to know uh, how much is reaching out to the neighborhood, considering that some people are not yes. right. Anything Chelsea. Just, anything just. Is there anything that you are doing in Chelsea? We're we're pretty much focused on this area in Hell's Kitchen. Hell's Kitchen. Okay. Can so, I, yeah. can I speak to it? Yeah, just <clears throat> this may be more commentary, not question, but since it's coming up, I have a child at PS2 and 2 Midtown yeah. West who participated in the Youth Orchestra of St. Luke's oh, program. He, he got the free violin. He got a very, very affordable after school yeah. classes. And perhaps the money went to the school and not Youth Orchestra of St. Luke's. Um, unfortunately, my child did not take to the violin and only did it for one year um, and complained about it quite a bit, but uh, that's his fault. Uh, the program is fantastic, and there's several other kids in the school who I know who are thriving. Um, and you do see the kids with the violins at Midtown West and PS51 and the Police Athletic League. And um, in addition to them doing the after school classes, which again like, are provided at extremely low cost, perhaps free um, from, from uh, YSOL. But uh, also they were taken to Carnegie Hall and the concerts of the Domena Center. It was, it was very engaged in the right. elementary school. No, it, health sounds, it to... sounds like that. I'm just yeah. trying to gauge whether, you know, this so is yeah. right, 20 people or uh, 500 people. And um, because when I go through the, again, the guideline, um, I mean, uh, it, you know, it's a great organization, but we have turned down. Yeah. So hold on. I'm just going to hold oh, this sorry. before we were starting to I mean, just to make sure that all questions are okay. Sorry. Are, no, okay. Uh, answered. Um, and then I, I do want to give the, the public a, a chance to speak. I'm, I don't see that many people still online, but uh, if anyone would like to speak on this or have questions for the applicants, and then I'm happy to engage with more wholesome conversation. You should here. have uh, invited Kiss. Uh, yeah, done the other way around so you guys have a little more. Uh, <laughs> um, if you want to speak on, on this, okay. um, all right. Well, now I, I'm happy to, to engage uh, in in more conversation about uh, the merits the merits of the application. And obviously, you know, if people do have more mm -hmm. questions, or but so, so it sounds like you know, James, right? We're trying to the, the threshold of that extraordinary. You know, we can see the record of public service. Uh, we can, we can, we have, you know, we know it. We know that you, you are doing amazing uh, uh, acts of service for our community uh, and for the, the children of our community. And it sounds like for artists in our community, uh, the question is, does it reach the level of the extraordinary? Um, and that is for us to discuss. Yeah, I'm, I'm totally uh, split on that issue because they have two buildings right there. You know, and you say, well, you know, if you, people want to know about this place, it's just like if you say Lincoln Center wanted a, a street sign. Yeah. yeah I, I mean, that just to me doesn't compute. I mean, they have fantastic, they are doing a great job. There is no question about any of that. And, but they have a long standing presence, they have an association with the community that fits. The person must have an extraordinary record of public service to the community. I, I'm not completely yeah. sure about that. Yeah, right? Yeah. What well, Misha was doing, you know, so, it's, it's if, if I could if if right. I could if I could step in and just talk yeah. to that. So we, we sure. really have impact in a number of ways. Some of the work that we do, we see impact as being broad. And some of the work we see the impact as being deep. And when you think of the effect of any yeah. one student who's given a free violin, and who's given a chance to work with the Orchestra of St. Luke's musicians and go to Carnegie Hall. And if you think about the extraordinary impact of that, it's the, the, the investment of the organization and the change in the life of the student, I think, is quite extraordinary. And, you know, when we moved here, this was the one area that we wanted to we wanted to see how can we what can we do for our neighbors that no one else can do? 
What is what is the thing that we have that's special that we can bring? And and so we did a study, found that there was a lack of these programs, and really felt that this was the way that we could make an extraordinary impact on the families. Mm -hmm. the thank you, thank you very much, James, uh, and and thanks for the for for filling out uh, the, this discussion for us. Um, so I'm gonna, we're gonna sort of move now to a committee discussion um, and, and talk amongst ourselves. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious to hear what people have to say. Uh, Sam? Yeah, one thing that's making me think of, um, just kind of we're gonna possibly have some discussion of the guidelines in general is, I think this sort of has established that they have a good link to this like community board floor and this district. Um, but they were struggling a little bit to give us numbers on exactly mm -hmm. how many of their students like fall in the exact district boundaries, which is totally fair. Why would you be even gathering that data unless you knew you were going to be applying for a street code anyway? Um, so I think one thing that we could um, possibly amend the guidelines to consider is I think it would be reasonable to look at um, impact on larger areas such as west side of Manhattan Manhattan is a whole New York City, not the whole world, but but to consider like organizations like this one where uh, I, I don't think our agriculture would say, especially because of the street code naming, like land use are a concern and the back street. But for a street code naming, I think it is reasonable to say an organization that um, you know helps uh, musicians who happen to live a block, a couple blocks out of the district seems totally reasonable and probably to consider. And it would make it much easier for them to consider like the numbers like they could just give us total numbers of virtually every musician or student they have is going to fall within the new york city area so we could just here look at those numbers and, and view that as our um, impact. i do just want to say any discussion about amending the guidelines would be for, for future exactly. applicants and won't because it'll take a long time to discuss and implement and, and pass so unfortunately would not apply to this particular applicant but it is something for us to, to talk about and think about yeah yeah i think in this particular case would just be an exception outside the guideline, but I would certainly like to hear some commitment towards uh, the Chelsea, rather than just exactly in that, um, that particular location that they're in that. Okay. Yeah, I agree with it. Um, because that's the common denominator. We're more in Chelsea as opposed to, and that may be the reason that we haven't seen or heard about your work. I think you have lo a lovely building I passed by, but again, I never thought to even look to see what was happening there. Okay. Yeah. One, of, one of the quick things I'm going to suggest if you, if you really want to make a powerful sort of uh, argument towards co naming of that particular segment of the street, I think you'll have to make a larger case. And Lincoln Center actually engages quite remarkably with high school programs, STEAM being one of those. Um, 444 to West 5060 is the school that I'll be trying to put name for one of the STEAM programs that they, they run. So you might want to sort of consider, I don't know what I'm saying actually, what I'm suggesting is that uh, maybe something that, that you could mention that in your future plan in term, terms of expanding the programs beyond where you are, from house kitchen down to Chelsea, at least consider our district C, which is CB4 in, I think that might be a good way to sort of uh, make a larger connection, I would think. You're saying what we're saying. Yeah, I have one more reading the guidelines, which I didn't realize before. It says the board will recommend denial if there is an application for more than one sign of any person of entity. Mm -hmm. So I think this issue of having two different organization is an issue. Um, and I still, I still think that people are getting People should be getting a tag, right? Uh, 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 what is it called the uh, street time, because they don't have a building, they don't have any other presence out there. And and to me that seems really a conflict. And and I love this organization, but to me that seems like okay. absurd of giving you know a street name yeah. when you have the building right there. Yeah, yeah. it's it's just completely. Uh, it seems that it's 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 out of the um, you know the, the scope yeah. of trying to get the street sign. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, and Christine, I, you you are actually kind of reading my mind a little bit. If you already got. You've already got better than a street sign. You've got a name on your building, That's which right. is right there. Um, 
But the but the other thing, and you know, just to kind of contrast this a little bit with the, the previous applicant, but just just because I think it makes that the point. Um, the reason why I think I came into that last one thinking, what the heck? I don't. I wouldn't even consider this. But what was what was compelling, even though it was unanimously voted against, um, was. So many people were coming, and Gene Simmons, well, we heard about it, that's cool, but he wasn't promoting it himself. It was coming from the people right. that was that were saying we're honoring this and we want um this this feels like you know we're an organization coming, we're promoting ourselves with the street right. sign. You know, we we had in the you know, the you know, those that have come <clears throat> before this application um uh, recently, the Intrepid. We had another um arts um organization. In Chelsea, one of forty kids. Right, right. Yeah. And, and, and I'm thinking about what was his kids, and right. well, yeah. and it doesn't mean that we don't appreciate the youth organizations and really think right. of it. And the fact that they don't reach out to Chelsea, I live in Chelsea, it doesn't bother me in the least yeah. oh. because 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 it's still very local to Hell's Kitchen, yeah. and what what's what's in Hell's Kitchen should just stay. Yeah. Sure. But um, but you know, I I think it's really more along the lines. Of, it's like you're saying, it's, um. Someone who we want to honor, his house doesn't live here, his apartment isn't here. What's what memory do we have left of this person? person? Yeah. Right. Yeah, or you know, I can even hear somebody making a case for or for an organization that maybe got started on this block in this neighborhood and has now grown to be an international thing, but when it started, it was right. very much a neighborhood institution. Mm -hmm. So I think when we're when we're naming things, it's really be, to, to to memorialize something to and, and to honor it. Yeah. And it's something that the people um you know are coming to 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 come and demand we want to have this. And they have a beautiful building. Yeah. I mean this is yeah, great. Super nice. Mm -hmm. Uh Charles? Just to give one other local reference, uh mm -hmm. Alvin Ailey is on 55th Street. Mm -hmm. And they have a co-naming. Mm -hmm. But this was because uh, of Alvin Ailey himself. Who, 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 was, who was deceased. Right. But it, I mean, that's like a little bit of a counterpoint to like they have a beautiful building right there that says Alabama. No, no, I just said that Alabama. yesterday. And I was saying, so, oh, we are going to have that. But this is the difference is that it's an individual and it's deceased. Yeah, it's it fair. was not the Albinelli organization. And as much as we, I think we celebrate the fact that Baruch Lakoff is still alive. And, yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Don't wish his uh, uh, imminent demise anytime yeah. soon. Mm -hmm. um, but but, like but in terms of the standards of, of you know, where so, so, it, someone yeah. along those lines, he's if he's part of the community, we don't want to make the case that he is an individual. You know that right. that would be um, that would be a completely different conversation. Right. Just one suggestion. I think mean, it should be saying when we haven't voted yet, but I think it's, it's an application that's sort of waiting to happen. So in other words, um, if programmatically you sort of expand your scope and contribution to the community, that's number one, and number two. Bring in more voices in support of your. But still, if you have a building, have, yes. if you have a building and it's yes. not a person yes. and the person is not deceased, that's, that's just not, a lot yes. of steps. So, so yes. you don't want to give um, yeah. maybe. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. So, sorry, You're right. That's it. Um, yeah, so I think I'll, I'll say, you know, so we, and this is why I'm. Certainly interested in having a, a discussion about amending the guidelines and, and talking about changes we want to make because uh, there is sort of you know what we have in these guidelines and do the applicants meet it uh, uh, what is written and and then on top of that there is what we do in practice and the precedent that we have set as a committee uh, which is its own extra layer and, and the precedent that we we have set is as being discussed of you know being wary of applications that just seem like they are. Um, an extra form of advertising for a uh, a business or even a nonprofit, nonetheless, that that does good work, but otherwise could uh, uh, you know advertise in other in other ways that isn't uh, uh, taking over the name of a street where other businesses who maybe uh, uh, you know have just as as uh, good records or or maybe contribute to the community in different ways uh, and don't get an opportunity to do that. Um, and so it's one of the reasons that the the threshold remains. So hi, I will say though, in comparison to Rosie's kids, just to bring it out there, mm -hmm. I do remember thinking that Rosie's kids, you know, the kids were sort of being bussed in from from everywhere, and they were really they were very positive. They are very positive uh, uh, contribution to the city as a whole and Manhattan as a whole. And, and here, they really have targeted our district. Uh, I do hear what you guys are saying about not necessarily taking outreach to Chelsea, but I think it, I think what we care about is are they are they 
enmeshed in our community? Are they? And I think they are. And I think they are too. I do think they are. I think that their connection to, and what the and it sounds like that what you do uh, uh, for the youth of our, our community um, <laughs> like should be should be celebrated um, and and should be commended. Um, uh, and the question, just of course, as it always is, remains: Does it uh, should it should it get a street co naming? Um, and, and you know, just based though mostly on the precedent, you know, I do think this sort of thing when it's, when it's an organization coming to us, not an individual or an organization isn't tied to an individual who is deceased and they themselves are the person that contributed to, or their, or their organization contributed to the community, but if they, it is a person who is deceased, um, it's, it gets harder from there. And again, uh, uh, you know, the other thing just to say, as we keep talking about is the reason that we have such a high threshold is because we are wary as a committee and as a board that anyone at any time can just re rename a street and we lose our sort of uh, uh, you know just name number system and every single street just gets a, a co name. <clears throat> and so it's it sort of it becomes important for us to to keep the threshold high. Yeah. Um, and, but I, you know I really am torn on this one though I have to say because they really have you know it was a, a presentation full of, of evidence of yeah. contributions yeah. directly to our community. Um, and I actually, I'm forgetting off the top of my head how long we've been, been here, but um, 20th anniversary, so there you go, 50th anniversary, right, right. Uh, uh, so um, I'm, I'm a little bit torn, frankly, <laughs> uh, but I, I don't know. Um, I, I don't think it's quite there, but I, I'm open to being. If it was head to head against the Intrepid, this one would have like five times over. Right. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not. So that's why I'm not. I'm not doing a comparison to the Intrepid. I'm probably. I'm doing a comparison to Rosie's kid. What was he? Probably what was he the most apt uh, uh, comparison here. Um, and uh, I'm going back to a plaque. Uh, uh, maybe a footprint right in front of a building line. Look, they, they have, have a building. So we're going to do that. I'm saying, what do you want to do? Yeah, we're well, yeah. still talking. Yeah. <laughs> Relax. Yeah. Take your yeah. take, take your sandwich. <laughs> should, we, should we know that we had a we, we had a street a street party? I mean, is there anyone? I just want to know if there's anyone who's thinking that they would vote in favor of this, and if they, if they are, now would be a good time to hear your yeah hear your you know make a pitch for it. Yeah, well, I, yeah. I think the bar that we've established should remain the same. I think there yeah. should be some room for exceptions. And as a as a, a, a holistic um, uh, you know effect on on the community, that's why I would. Favor um, approval. So you're in favor of approval, no, knowing though that it is as an exception, meaning as an exception right. to both, <clears throat> both our guidelines right. and precedent. I mean, I haven't dug into the, the guidelines as much, but I think what, what, what's been established by the board already, I think, should remain fairly firm in terms of that's what you know, you're, you're thinking about doing going forward in terms of the discussion, but I think there should be some room for exception. I, I like the guidelines the way they are. Like there should be some room in that guidelines to make okay. it make So more of a comment, maybe on allowing exceptions in the guidelines, but not necessarily. Yeah. Yeah. But, 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 yeah. right. Alan, we, we, are you not bothered? And again, I'm, I'm, this is a difficult one. Are you are you not bothered by the fact that they have a building yeah. right on the street? Yeah. I, I, I think I think the the um, the uh, students that. Uh, will attend the building, they go into a building. But I think it's a difference when you're a student and you're walking down the street as your son might have done with his violin, which right. you care for, you carry around, and you see the sign there says, oh, you know, he has an attachment. There's more of an attachment, not to the building, but that there's something in the neighborhood for that student or that parent or that, that is here. I mean, buildings are building. They're nice buildings, bad buildings, are <clears throat> a sign that, you know, you know, it stands out. I think mm. it lends more of an attachment from the resident to that uh, institution. But, well, no, but I, I'm kind of split right. like Christine is, but I think uh, you know, make a point. Right? There's a, a couple of buildings that have names on them, and they're monuments by themselves. Just I'm talking about the names right. being there on the buildings, they're institutions. And I think that kind of suffices for what it intends to do. Uh, the second thing is, you know, the other guidelines in terms of person, you know, there alive or in their, you know, particular contribution to the larger community. So you're a good candidate. That's what I, I end up saying. You're a yeah. very good candidate and an excellent candidate for but this. Nobody died. 
Well, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Very good, very and good. I think that's the kind of, uh, you know, the, the kind of disconnect. This is what I mean, I can you imagine what happened if we do that and then everybody who is a good candidate who has a building, etc., wants a, a, a sign? Mm -hmm. I mean, there is. There's been a fair lot out there. Right. 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 Right a motion uh, here. I mean, it, it, this is one of those that's either approved or denied. So it's a. Uh, uh, I mean, I'll make that motion, but I think we should, we should not because unfortunately, it doesn't, sort of, it doesn't really meet that very high threshold that our guidelines have established. And the fact that, you know, we already sort of discussed that. So, yeah. so I made a motion. So we have a motion to deny. We have a second. All those in favor of denial, raise your hand. Okay. All those, uh, all those opposed. Yeah. 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 Okay. What? Oh, oh, we have an abstain. All right. I don't know what item we're on, Christine. But <laughs> uh, any, any present not eligible. Okay. With a, a heavy heart for from all of us, James and uh, Johnny and Amanda. Um, obviously, you know it's, it was. Um, really impactful and powerful for us to hear all the contributions that you made to our community and um we are certainly now for those who weren't aware of you certainly are now um and uh we as i said to you know, we i think we as a community board and this committee would love to partner with you to help promote the work that you do and help you get connected to the schools in our district um and help you get more <laughs> invested in chelsea uh, programs uh and to get the word out about your rehearsal space and your performance space which sounds incredible <clears throat> Um, but uh, I, we're not sure that the co-naming of a street is the way to do all that. So uh, uh, for now, we are voted to denial, but as always, it goes to the full board, which meets um, May first. May first, um, and uh, you know, you're always welcome to uh, you. You know, at full board, everyone gets two minutes to speak. If you wanted to speak for two minutes and make a last pitch, you are more than welcome to. I don't know. Is there any information for Jesse for his monthly uh, newsletter? Oh yeah, sure. We have a monthly newsletter that goes out to all the um, uh, block associations and community board members, and you know, sure it's got thousands of people on it. And you know, you should definitely be making sure that you're in contact with our our office to get your name on there and your events on there. Um, and also, I should say, we every community board meeting we have regular updates from FIT about what they're up to that month. Um, I, I highly encourage you guys to 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 do the same uh, so that you your presence becomes more well known in our community. You know. Uh, uh, but thank you again. Thank you for the time. And I go, of course, thank you for being so patient. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Yeah, thank you. Have, this is a beautiful organization. There is no question about it. I think, I think the discussion is about the method chosen for uh, honoring that. Yes. And I think this is that method which is questionable for us because of our guidelines, etc. But, you know, everybody loves what you are doing. Well, we we appreciate the seriousness with which you took the application, and it was fascinating to hear the conversation. I have to say, so we also have we we all have heavy hearts tonight. Um, we're all disappointed by this outcome very much, but uh, we do appreciate your seriousness with which you took the uh, the consideration, and we hope to see you. you here. Thank you for the presentation. We, yes, we will, we will definitely be seeing you. Thank you so much. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank Bye. you. Have a good night. Um, all right. Now I am mindful of the time. Yes. One clarifying question. Yes. You said that he could come back. So the denial is also going to the full board? Yes. So and everything has to be ratified by the full board and voted on. And so we are, yeah. We are. We are just, so they and the KISS people could come back. Everybody. Yeah, everyone everyone come back. Well, they have to come and, and make a okay. Yeah. Right, because at the full board is the place where there is the formal vote. Here, oh, what we are doing is recommendation, recommendation. to the board. Okay. But, and that's May. 
That is May, but right. very typically right. what happens because there's not a lot of time for, there's so many committees and so many votes at the full board, and there's not a lot of time. So typically what comes out of committee gets ratified in the full board. That's what I figured. I just yeah. wanted to make sure I had it right. No, you got Thank it. you. Thank um, you. All right. And so, that meeting is May 1st? Yeah, May 1st. Yeah, yes. Um, so now I am Michael, time, David, uh, and recognizing we have a couple of items left on the agenda. So uh, to, to finish up this discussion of street code namings, I obviously, the actual discussion of amending the guidelines could launch us, I think, into an hour, two hour discussion, and I'm not about to do that. Yes. So, um, and, and I think one of the other things I do want to say about it, though, is uh, to think about is, you know, I think because we allow entities to keep coming before us in the guidelines, uh, uh, that's why we keep having nonprofits. And it seems to me that we, we have a, you know, perhaps even higher threshold for nonprofits uh, because we're a little wary of the advertising na nature of that. And so um, things to think about in terms of uh, redoing the guidelines. So uh, my proposal, uh, actually this is Christine's idea, but my, our proposal would be to uh, you know, form some sort of subcommittee who might want to look into this and uh, uh, meet a couple times and propose changes. I am happy to volunteer for the subcommittee. Is and, anyone and that you, you, you abstain uh, from just the board. What does it take for us? It should be those three. Alex, you want to go to the subcommittee? Yeah. yeah. And what <laughs> Who else? I need one more. We need one more for a subcommittee. We need to. Hey, you got kicked off your I, 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 I got time now. I'm okay. going. No. So, what subcommittee okay. is this? So, this is. You're just on the redoing the guidelines for the street code, I mean. It's coming back to the committee. So, that we don't have to teach. Right, like that being so upset for putting down. Well, we do miss you from Canada, so we're just talking about you guys too. Um, all right. Oh, we have Alison May. I don't know. No. Oh, who's more? Are you back at the office? Yeah. You said yeah. yes. Oh, okay. absolutely. Name it. No, so no, no, all right. We have enough for a subcommittee. If we just get a motion to form the subcommittee. Right. Anyone? Motion. Yeah. Yeah. Motion to right. second. <laughs> we're going to call it a working group. We're going to call it a working group. Or because that's what I have to come Yeah, yeah. A working group of whatever. All right. All those in favor of a working group for a yeah. naming the revising yeah. deadline. Right. Anyone opposed? Uh, I would stand that means in one month from coming and then you'll send us some recommendation and why, and then we'll all discuss. <laughs> yes, I need to correct. We got one more. We got one more. We got one more on the agenda. What? Uh, busway on Forty Second oh. Street. Let's make this as uh, super quick as possible. Super uh, So CB six, which happened to be on the east side. Uh, called me and others and say, okay, we want to start to work on the busway on the 34th Street and we, uh, uh, or 42nd Street. And I made a pitch that 42nd Street needed a busway more than 34 because 34 already has a an SBS. Mm -hmm. And then we have the Port Authority and all those things. So they are going to start working on that. And uh, we are going to start working on that. So next, meeting, we'd like to have a discussion and maybe invite some people to come and see whether what issues that would create and what concerns we have. And you know that the busway is like the 14th Street, right? Yeah, 14th, yeah. right? Which is like we would have buses and then cars have to leave at the next turn, mm -hmm. you can have trucks and all of that. So I think, mm -hmm. I think we want to put that on the calendar next month. And discuss it, yes. and maybe uh, have a resolution. I will circulate the resolution from them, and then we can discuss that. Okay. Okay. Sounds good to me. We stated uh, committee board six or five. Six. Six. Community board five is in a yeah. complete right. upheaval. Oh, right. 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 So nobody knows who is what. Can I just quickly say one quick thing? 40 seconds speed. I think that's very really good thing. I, I don't know how many people know. I was in Vaughan, but there was a time when they actually wanted to put a tram along 40 seconds. Yes, speed. Yeah, they yeah. Yeah. And then GM came, jumped in at that point in time and said, We're going to give you three buses. Please don't put the tram. Right. right. So they put the buses there. Now they've got the buses. Let's have the buses. That's right. my argument. 
but they killed that very, very good, very plant. beautiful. So I think beautiful plant. So Christine will draft something that will go around for us, for us to uh, uh, sign off on it next month's meeting. Uh, but I guess that's what we're just saying. About. No, no, we're just. All right, we'll talk about that next next month. So now we'll be on the agenda. Be aware. Be aware. It is now nine twenty. Uh, is there a motion to adjourn? Motion. Second. Second. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone who's online. Janine, thank you so much. Um, signing off from.